Okay, so I must uh, continue with my embarrassing uh, procession of, of interesting things, and, and I will also outline, let's say, the limit or the extent um, of the things that I have since understood uh, and, and where I've kind of run out of road, which I, I still need to meditate, I guess, to, but I mean, I can perhaps synthesize some speculation as to possible syntheses. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to just try to give an honest overview, and uh, this just helps me theoretically, because it helps to sort of see the plight that I'm in, so that I can perhaps work towards uh, overcoming it. But um, it, it, it appears that I'm not that far off from being completely... Um, done uh, with my theory. Okay, so uh, there was actually some clerical errors in what I said earlier. My original diagram, which I think will probably be in the in the this will be the second half of the recording. In the first half of the recording, I was incorrect about the placements of these circuits, and that was just a clerical error. That wasn't um, an error in the theory. That was just an error in me reading it and. Anyway, I, there was only one clerical error, and that just actually puts the line and the calf in order, which is interesting. So it actually does line up, um, and in some sense, making that mistake in the first place, perhaps even as an indirect evidence of my bona fides, that, you know, I don't just sort of make, you know, I didn't, I didn't revise this to make it line up, and I was happy with it not being aligned in, in the in the first half. But anyway, um, uh, but for the, the clerical error. Um, anyway, so I do have a better, I think, layout and description now, a good overview. So I'll probably show in this, it will be something like the second half of the recording. I will show, I will show one diagram and then I'll show the same diagram with more detail filled in but the it probably really looks pretty populated with lots of things all over the place which make it look a bit crazy but it that's as that's almost as com I don't know which I don't know which one you're seeing yet if you're seeing the one with the words of all the 24 emotional tones written on top of the lines then you're seeing it as the most complicated as it can possibly be. Um, which, as an as an overview diagram of the whole of metagram theory, is is not too bad. Um, well, no, it's not really the whole of metagram theory because it doesn't. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk about how metagram circuits correspond with this overview model. So, let let me say some basic things. So. Um, this whole model, in some sense, is going to perhaps even exist in triplicate, or at least duplicate. That there's going to be... The unconscious side of the mind can be seen as your version of this model. Of your footprint on this model. Then you're going to have a second model... of the same thing, which could be said as an environmental anatomy of karma. So it's going to be, well, how does your, how does your personal image of yourself and in, you know, in as much as that you can, uh, how, how do I put this? I think that this model could be projected as, as human, as anthropomorphic. This is the model of anthropomorphism anthropomorphization essentially when people say the word anthropomorphize i'm not even pronouncing it correctly but that word that's this when people say that i believe this model is what they mean and you can do this the image of the in, the image of how the the mental exchanges the mental relays the the, the possible the actual conduits through which cognition um, flows through. These are the pathways, as it were. And so you can have this for each individual, and you can have this for, ha for, for a kind of collective, communal, organizational, um, you know, so, so you, 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 um, 
you know, so you, you might have one of these for each relationship in your life or something like that, or within, within each relationship that exists also within a particular culture, which has a kind of anthropomorphized sort of element to it, where I think that this is what, that there is a psychological component to culture and, you know, sort of perhaps regionality or, you know, sort of when people, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it's interesting how some people's personalities seem to be especially, especially exacerbated or accentuated by their particular, you know, when people come across foreigners. Um, you know, it, it's interesting how this particular topic is described in the scriptures when it's talking about, you know, that, uh, you know, if you are one of those people that sort of uh, uh, get get whisked away by falling in love with with people who are foreign that there's 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 a there's an implicit sort of um teaching there about the quality of the relationship being essentially um supported by the crutch of their foreign that they represent not only their individual psychology but they represent a kind of bolstered um, map uh, or, or territory um, they, they seem more than just an in individual because they have a kind of context that they bring with them um, which has been implanted almost in their cultural environmental model of how they situate themselves within a kind of almost could call it maybe a, an epistemology or something like that that people um, have grown up and imprinted on a certain reliable kind of of that everyone in the culture that they grew up in expected that a certain conduit a certain pathway had only a set amount of um, or, or a particular fashion or style of dispensing or deploying um, or, or, or mediating uh, um, or judging other pathways. And so you had a kind of fixed filter on that structure. And that fixed filter could then be used as a landmark and an anchorage to, to be a dependent structural buttress for other things so you could depend on that that would be treated in that way and so you didn't have to do a lot of high level thinking about it because that was sort of reduced to some kind of rules-based superficiality or something like that that parts of of the pathway in the general anatomy of of the human mind were just kind of taken for granted as it were or were given a very fixed set of of um valences or or um or a, or a fixed spectrum of of um of permissible you know, so anyway, so, so that the culture was the let's say the order of the culture or the the regimentation of the culture, the structure of the culture was written in that in the fabric of that conduit was the the that 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 the matrix that it, uh, um, was like the uh, uh, the backdrop and the womb for the development of people. Uh, in in that context could depend on that being a stable or simple or like known quantity or, or something like that although paradoxically I, uh, that's maybe a wrong thing to say that because when things are culturally unknown when they are when when things are collectively a known quantity that means individually they're an unknown quantity there's a lot of mystery there's a lot of deception that's woven into that there's a lot of social manipulation and sort of truncation of reality and the truth that is hidden underneath that stone to be unturned um 
Okay, so, and that creates, if you are coming across a foreigner that has that kind of crutch, you are coming across, therefore, a species of sophistication that you are not in a position to look to, to look underneath that stone and if you can't if you can if you can't uh, if you're unable to leave no stone unturned then you're not going to know the individual on a very deep level it's going to create a certain um I mean, obviously, individuals can bridge these kinds of divides. It's not as if it's impossible to have a deep, profound relationship with a foreigner. It, it, um, uh, I'm, I'm merely talking about the the trappings or the um, the uh, the hurdle uh, that that if this hurdle is not is not confronted uh, 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 directly, then then it it will lead to what I would regard as a low quality or superficial kind of um relationship but anyway that's a anyway so um okay so so that's this model okay now um the reason why the rectangles that have two circles being conjoined in those rectangles the reason why that those exist is because that yeah i mean sorry this diagram is is a superior uh, from the last diagram in a, in a lot of ways because i found a more intuitive way of displaying some things that that are more make more more sense uh, um but i understand how dense this diagram is it's a bit crazy but anyway so there are each each circle just has one number in it because it's one of the 12 cognitive functions um 12 from the 17 extraction uh, 12 extracted from the 17 model the 12 which are not the final five the reason why these groupings exist in these rectangles or that there are some circles without rectangles with numbers in them is that each of these things so so there are eight there are eight groupings each of these groupings symbolizes a, a code um each of these groupings uh uh these eight, eight things. Um, okay, because because when these, when two of these uh, um, cognitive functions interact with one another, one is always dominant, and the other one is kind of, is like the kind of thing. So it's, it's not as if that these are equal elements that have covalent bonds they do have two different ways of bonding with each other but they're not equally covalent there's there's a main there's a primary and then there's a kind of and and then there's the kind of the, the one that's orbiting it to some degree although the one that's orbiting it can actually in one of in one of the forms of of, of bonding it can actually sort of be stronger or more important but in some sense it, it gravitates towards what's happening with one of them anyway uh, sorry the reason why i have to trot out that detail is because um because in that way each individual circle with a number in it can be seen to be representative of only two emotional tones both m emotional tones are made up of um two cognitive functions but of which only one of them is the is the dominant or the primary or the kind of the the central definitional kind of um uh, gr gr uh, 
groundwork of it. Okay, so, so for example, if you look at 1 and 10, 1 is the dominant and 10 is the, uh, is the kind of, is the thing that's being covalently bonded to it. And so the, the arrow that goes from 1 to 10, all the, there aren't arrows drawn on, on each line. But once you know one arrow in, in, a, in, a, in a grouping of three, you know, you can see that there are these kinds of circles made in, in groups of three that, that make up the lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle. Um, that because the arrow is pointing from one to 10, you can kind of imagine that the arrow is saying that one is greater than 10. And so one is, is the dominant. And so, but the truth is, is that it, it's not just that one is greater than 10. Um, because the second emotional tone actually is, is almost the opposite, is that 10 is greater than one, but it's still based on the one should be represented first. So is, so they're kind of, there, there, there are two things is that cognitive function one is greater than cognitive function 10. And then that is called being confused. That's why confused is written on the line between one and 10, and it's written closer to one. And that is the kind of the, um, you could call it the stagnant emotional tone because it means that the one is is holding its ground and the one where 10 is kind of is being expressed greatly while attaching itself to one is angry now these two emotional confused and angry are actually different and and although this is slightly theoretical and i've never um, anyway, the, 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 my original theory is, is that in confused, one is being expressed to the exclusion of 10, but when 10 is being expressed with one, they are both expressed. It's just that 10 is, is stronger than one, but they are both positive. So angry is a positive emotion in that sense and confused is a negative emotion because one is negating 10. Whereas when, and, and as a shorthand, I used to write this as one is greater than 10. So if one is greater than 10, that's a negative. But if, if 10 is greater than one, that's still a positive because they're both being expressed. It's just that 10 is stronger than one in that expression. And so you can almost see that as that when one is, when one is producing angry, therefore, there's a there's also and I, I speculate that what this also does is it's sattva because one is a sattvaic cognitive function. The fire of sattva is giving way to the water of tamas. So when the fire of sattva is is giving way to the water of tamas, you are being angry. And then you could also argue that that is giving you room to be terrified or lonely. And you'll notice that if you, if you go to the second emotional tone, not the closer one, but always the further one, then you are capable of going in a, in a, in a circle. You're capable of, of fluidly kind of moving around now. Okay. So that's what's happening inside of a circuit. Now, that's not the, I, that's perhaps also, so when, when someone is being angry, you're, you're giving somebody else permission in your environment to be terrified or lonely is going to be the kind of environmental karmic influence that that's going to have. If you produce anger, you are inflicting or imposing or inviting or offering somebody else, you're empowering them because you're empowering cognitive function 10. And so somebody else who has an emotional tone preference of, um, of using cognitive function 10 with cognitive function 15 can express terrified or lonely, potentially. You're, you're usher, uh, ushering them in, perhaps. You're facilitating them. Okay, anyway, that's a side thing. And, you know, um, okay, so 
Now there's another mechanism which is completely separate to this, which is why one and two are sharing a rectangle together. The reason why that they are grouped together in a rectangle is because the double, and this is also the reason why there's a double arrow connecting one and ten, is because one and ten is similar to two and eight. And the arrow goes... The code 2 and 8 together and the code 1 and 10 together are supported by the same pairing of final five cognitive functions. They are supported by the father, cognitive function 16, and they are supported by the blood, cognitive function 7. So the reason why 1 and 2 have a circle around it like that is because that's actually the, the 1 and 2 being rectangled together is meant to symbolize that the 1 and 10 pairing and the 2 and 8 pairing have the same support structure. So if your mental grammar is supporting confused or angry, there's going to be a... Now, this is a bit speculative and slightly theoretical, but I, I believe that this is essentially how it works, is that... At the same time as choosing to be confused or angry, you're going to simultaneously choose to be scared or elated. That there's going to be a corresponding mirror. So that confused and scared is going to have a kind of resonance and angry and elated is also going to have a kind of resonance. That if you're angry about something, you're also going to be simultaneously elated about something. Maybe subtextually. Maybe, but it's going to sort of be in the realm of of Dharma. It's going, it's going to be, this is a kind, I would argue that this is, I mean, I have to find another word. There might be another better word, but I would say that this is a kind of Dharmic, um, uh, intermingling here. Okay. So, and so also if somebody else is being angry, that is going to goad or impel or perhaps, you know, sort of um, open the door to having a kind of resonance with someone who is being elated. And if you're being confused, that's going to have a kind of resonance with somebody else. You could have, you could have a shared conversation where you could both be helping, seemingly talking through the same thing, even though you're talking about different things interpersonally, that you each have a different interpersonal thing. But what you're saying might have a lot of correspondence. It might have, because it is, it's being, it's supported by the same agents of consciousness. It's supported by the same agentic um, identities on the throne of God, as it were. Um, it, it's supported by the same mental the source of mental grammar. It's being supported by the same sources of mental grammar. So there's going to be a kind of um, compassion, perhaps, as well. Um, okay, so there's that going. So that's what the double arrows mean. Whenever you see a double arrow, it means it has a particular dharmic correspondence. And that particular dharmic correspondence, I'm just using this jargon for now until I come up with better, um, is essentially you can work it out by seeing where these double arrows are placed on this diagram and where the rectangles are are grouping two circles together. And so I'll just uh, say them out loud so that people aren't... Uh, so uh, 5 and 2 is mirrored by 17 and 6. Because... It has to be the arrow that's coming from the thing in in the rectangle. And so sad and relieved is being mirrored by shy and relaxed. And uh, silly and excited is being mirrored by condescending and bored. Okay. Um, so those are kind of... Dharmic correspondence. Okay, so there's that. Now, um, and I, you know, so I, I said that one and two are therefore grouped because they're both supported by the same pairing of the final five. Eight and nine are um, 
both so I, I can you know it, it's not hard to work out except I'm just going to be slightly embarrassing when I have to because I don't know what to call three I've always thought of three as the Lord God of hosts but um, that doesn't really uh, that's it, um, you know that was spoken about a lot in the Old Testament and it wasn't spoken a lot in the New Testament in fact that would be nice if if <laughs> someone could could uh, uh, You know, I always used to describe it also as uh, the fire in the eyes of the Lord. Um, dimension three. But uh, cause, cause the, I know, it, it's such an ephemeral sort of thing. I mean, dimension three is a is a very is a very basic when I say basic, I mean, fundamental form of T.I. Um, you know, it, it's almost like the axiom of the law of identity. If you don't have it, you can't do anything. You don't have anything to make decisions um, from. In terms of knowing that you've made a choice. Um, You know, it, it, it's the thing that gives you the, the ability, I would even say, to have, um, I don't know, this, it gets so esoteric, but, uh, you know, you, you, you know, I would even link it perhaps to, um, Ein, in, in, uh, in Kabbalah, it, 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 I think the closest thing to dimension three would essentially be Ein. Uh, anyway, I, I don't want to talk about um, esoteric, uh, uh, sort of esoteric uh, m m metaphysics is, is going to be a bit of a waste of time to talk about at the at the point at at, at this point in time. Um, I can give a whole lecture about Einsof or and and my particular uh, reading of of that. Um, which is in, in another recording anyway um so another important correspondence here and and this is the thing which is going to require me to um play around more with my metagram circuits because i've only been looking at my own personality and it looks incredibly promising just how detailed it is the problem is that i i haven't looked at all the other circuits and looked at how um, if this if this solves all the problems, then it is a full reverse engineering of Metagram. Would be great if it is, but I mean, I'm also at the same time trying to synthesize understanding of what's going on. Um, the reason why all these other symbols exist on top of here, why they're triangles and squares and circles, is because there are four symbols that are drawn in black and there are two pair sorry uh, yeah there are four symbols that are drawn in black and then there are two pairings that are drawn in red or two unique red symbols so there are six symbols all together and these symbols are there only to show pairs and the pairings that these show are um correspondences of alchemical signature so 15 and 1 has got this kind of black square with a white circle in it or with a blank circle inside of it which was my symbol for earth because 15 is is an earth element and 12 is an earth element 12 is the earth element of sattva which so this is going to get very sort of ironic it, 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 it hold in one's head but in 12 is literally the light the light of reason the lights of um i i believe 12 was actually the first thing that was that was made in creation as well it was it was dimension 12 uh which god placed himself in the light in his creation at the start of creation um 
anyway, but uh, uh, that's again almost sort of cabal, type, uh, Kabbalah type um, esoteric uh, metaphysics, which I don't want to get into. Okay, so so twelve nine and fifteen one or cautious and shocked and bashful and anxious have the same alchemical subcomponents if you conflate them down just to alchemical elements. They're both made out of earth and fire. That's why they share the same symbol. Th that's what all the symbols mean. So there are only two of each symbol. Okay, the reason why some symbols are red is because these emotional tones do comprise of the same elements. They, they, do, they, they do consist of the same alchemical elements, but they don't exist in the same order. They are inverted. So 10 and 15 has got the red square with the, with the solid uh, red dot inside of the red square. It kind of looks like the Japanese flag. So the, the 10 and 15, uh, 10 is the dominant cognitive function here. 10 is the, um, is water, is a water tamasic element. And 15 is the earth rajasic element. But anyway, so this is, this is a, a tamas, um, uh, both terrified and lonely are tamasic emotional tones. And if we look at that same symbol, we see it's between 17 and 6. And 17 is the dominant here, which is the earth element. And 6 is the rajasic um, water element. And so lazy and calm. And so there, there is an alchemical symmetry here, but it's inverse. So... If you want to actually look at the same alchemical lineup, terrified is going to be the same as lazy, and calm is going to be the same as lonely. So now, that's how this diagram works. Now, the truth is, is that I don't know the full reach of this correspondence like i'm sure that it's profound and i'm sure that it can probably answer a lot of things but i haven't gotten a, a really clinched finished veneered understanding of all the implications that's something that i'm going to have to meditate on but i can talk about at least how i'm putting this together with metatype Okay, so within someone's metatype, and my metagram circuits of each individual personality style has got a certain code of alchemical elements, and it's also got, I wrote out emotional tones that those codes cor correlated to, or that they translated to for each guna. That still needs to be sort of reverse engineered because it might not be um i knew that there were errors in that but no i can't call them. they're not errors i knew that i didn't know everything about what i was modeling and i knew the very i, I knew certain possibilities as it were and I didn't know which of those possibilities were correct, but I knew that I could only answer the question later at this point that I'm at now. And so I knew that basically it's the problem of ambiguity, that when I have a code, when I have an alchemical code, it can mean more than one thing in from this model. Okay. And metagram circuitry is rubbish if it can't, my metagram circuitry, as it stands, can still be falsified. The idea, the because essentially you just have to. All the emotional tones that I have listed in my metagram circuitry are even wrong because I changed 
the emotional tones later on, I revise them. I like, you know, and in fact, I used to refine, oh, well, this cognitive inflection should be called this name, should be called this of one of the 24 emotional tones. Okay, so what you see before you is the final draft of which emotional tone or what. But then I didn't even go back and fix my metagram circuits because I knew that they were wrong because those metagram circuits only contain emotional, only contain eight emotional tones. Each, okay, so this is, so in my original metagram research, each guna, um, I have to explain things about the state of my old work, which is uh, confusing because to listen to it is not to be un is not to understand anything. It's it's uh, it's a uh, it's it's not something that's worth considering. But uh, let me just state it f uh, perhaps for my vanity, but but but, uh, but just to show that it actually does have real merit. Um, so so I overuse the names of some emotional tones. I corresponded. I correspond. I, I, I corresponded alchemical codes to the same emotional tone, even though that's not possible. And the reason why I did that was because I didn't know how to correspond. Um, each guna to more than one. I, I always suspected that, um, that it was probable that each guna had access to more than one set of emotional tones. But I didn't know how to overcome the ambiguity of, well, which one is it? And so I knew that it would, that I would have to come up with some kind of general rule some kind of some way to, to work that out which is still what i have to work out okay um but i didn't want to do that until i had a solid model of metatype now that i have a solid model of metatype i've got more data points to try to work out what the what if there is a general formula essentially to 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 overcoming the ambiguity Essentially, that's it. Um, so, my metagram circuits, in, in as much as that they include emotional tones, are not junk because I use those emotional tones in a consistent way. And so, each name of an emotional tone because each gunner only has eight. So I used each one twice. So in, in, in each gunner of emotional tone, there, there are two different alchemical definitions for each of those emotional tones. Anyway, you could replace them all with just with just letters, with just numbers, it doesn't make it, I, I mean, like random identities, just, just labels, just, you could replace them all with labels. And then it just gives you essentially something to populate, something to fill in that, that, that was the, anyway, it's not that important. Um, so once I have a general sort of formula that then I know where the identity should slot in, or at least I know how to, hypothetically put this all together and then you know run it through some kind of falsification of or, or some kind of empirical test or something like that anyway so so that's that's the state of that which is um yeah anyway uh but so long um there's not that much ambiguity. Um, there's less ambiguity for types like mine, because my type is a double circuit type, which means that essentially my type has one of the least ambiguities because it just, inc it's inclusive of the, amb my circuitry includes 
whatever ambiguity exists for other people who are single circuits. And I think I've actually uncovered um, the actual functioning of bipolar type 1, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about here. So my stimulus, which is essentially my subconscious, um, has two emotional tones, not one. And the two emotional tones are... Um, I think it's does should um, sorry I don't have it in front of me I should have um, I did write it oh yeah no it's confused rushed so my stimulus is confused rush where's rushed uh, oh it's over there okay so it's the triangle so the triangle symbol is is linking 1 and 10 and 2 and 5. And so I am, my stimulus is confused and rushed, confused or rushed. And then my primary counter offer is annoyed, which is. Now, uh, you see, I originally called annoyed angry, but I since later changed the identities of these things. So I'm no longer an ang. Uh, uh, my naming convention still exists. So I mean, I still call myself, I think, the second angry eight or, or something like that, or or the first. I can't even remember either the first or the second angry eight. I had a really stupid naming convention because I, anyway, I would just name people after their primary counter offer because that seemed to be the simplest um, aspect of each type was the primary counter offer because it kind of gets pincered by the um, unconscious and the super ego. But anyway, um, it gets settled by both of those things and it has to sort of be simpler than the other things, um, which is also something that I need to perhaps theoretically double check and, and speculate against as well but um okay so confused and rushed and then annoyed is oh my word why can't i oh it's because i wrote it upside down oh, that's not helpful uh, is between 13 and 7 is annoyed so you notice that confused and rushed are both closer functions they're not fluid, they're not positive functions, they're both negative functions. So both my um, stimuluses are negative functions. And my primary counter off is a positive function, annoyed. And then I should also say that, um, I think I'll, I'll say that later. Um, and then my emergent response is worried or silly. So... Worried is on the other side of annoyed, is also between 13 and 7, and silly is between 4 and 12, is the, is an, is an, silly is a negative function, and worried is also a negative function. Okay, so, um, now, the, now I think that these things exist where they exist, spread out over these different sectors and in between there is going to be a kind of and this is very speculative but I'm, I'm generally thinking that I think that the super ego is perpetuating a kind of puppetry of all of all these it was keeping track of all these things and you are trying to create um a mystery narrative of regularity and, de and dependability that lets you link up these things. But it, it's also probably more complicated than that because the, how these things link up are also how these things are established on the territory of this model. So how rushed and confused corroborate annoyed 
becomes a habitual imprint um, of of arriving at that destination that I think that pathway in some sense or that integration as it were is what one side of the mind is cultivated around facilitating and so when you look at the meta type sides of the mind they are doing that in different operations in different independent operations in different spheres of operation to one another although with some interference on the fringes and i think that generally especially when people are young and not not too young maybe around man i'm so bad at ages um maybe from the ages of even six to eleven you see a streak of confabulation in young children uh, it's almost a kind of dishonesty but you can tell that they are trying to um, harvest a kind of affection and support and collateral uh, endorsement from what I could only perhaps called as bridging conduits and pathways they are they are trying to find a formula of of internal um cohesion as it were and i think that this might also be um what disrupts the development of the subconscious in um the narcissist uh because essentially the the oedipal mother is dispensing and orchestrating the environmental dispensation of affection or not to say that they show affection but that their control becomes um what displaces what would otherwise be regarded as um let's say the healthy cocoon of um can't remember the actual term i i term it naive um naive naive narcissism or, or you know sort of the healthy developmental narcissism which they all talk about um you know even freud and and uh, uh anyway um And in some sense, it's because they have to do this. They have to do the pathway connection in real time because they don't yet have a developed unconscious side of the mind to do it automatically for them or to, to know that they have a, um, a rubric of it, which is, I'm going to, seemingly contradict myself narcissists i think do have an unconscious but they have it as a um in as much as that they have it without going through the motion of actually doing it before encapsulating it or crystallizing it within the unconscious they have cemented over a fragmented subconscious I realize that, you know, in listening to me, it sounds like I've got everything backwards because, you know, you know, these people, they talk about Sam Buckman talks about having an exploded ego and I'm talking about him having 
essentially a um, an un sort of an un an improperly confected sub subconscious, but it's also you know some of these things are almost simultaneously true as well because it's about the the tandem development of these sides of the mind. They they have to corroborate and model each other and um, sort of function as, as a tandem um, organ as, as, as uh, the mechanics of which I think I've, 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 I've started uh, talking about here in terms of that it's, it's actually forging the, the actual connection of these pathways and so the stimulus and uh, okay, it's 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 also more complicated th than this because, I mean, I've just talked about the stimulus reaching towards the the primary counter offer. My confused and rushed emotional tones corroborating with annoyed, but I do actually think that the emergent response is ontologically prior that someone chooses their emergent or well, this might be different for each gunner i was a sattvaic personality so anyway it might, might be different um that was part of my some of my theory in in metagram circuits um so i i believe perhaps tamas starts with um with the primary counter offer and and sattva, I, b I believe starts with with the emergent response and maybe Raja starts w w with with the stimulus, but anyway, um, that might also be I'm saying that off the top of my head, but anyway, I'm just gonna, but the the emergent response is happy to be independent of the other pathways that are happening on here. The emergent response can just be like a um, the emergent response, I think, can have an independent support from the superego. It doesn't need to be connected with these other things. So I, I think that the hardest thing here, w and, and the superego could be regarded as being the other side of the primary counter offer, the, the, the mystery side, the, 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 um, so so it's almost as if the emergent response is going to be the first operator on this whole diagram. Then the subconscious at some point is going to be born, and at some point the subconscious is going to link up with the primary counter offer, which is like the front. When I say it, really is an authentic thing. It's it's literally like the mother in the matrix. Sorry, the the oracle, which which was also said to be like the mother of the matrix, and the architect is the father. It, as, sorry, I'm going to use this because it, it just makes it easier to explain. Um, and it's also why I helped write the movie. But anyway, um, that, that the oracle is, is, the, is represented in the ego, but what, it, what, what the oracle actually represents is the machine world. But it's the part of the machine world that actually wants, you know, there to be something new born in the matrix, an actual novation. Neo itself means new in Latin. Um, but so it is the unconscious side of the mind which is directly connected to the superego, but it is distinct to the superego. And the superego does communicate with it, but it, it's, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a one-way thing. The, 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 the oracle, the mother, does not get to actually look behind the curtain and see what's really going on in the, um, in, in, in the nitty-gritty of the machine world. And what's actually going on there 
is support for the emergent response, which can be like Agent Smith, which can be like its own... It, 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 it can go and play a kind of weird kind of puppet master... You know, it, it can have its own outlets and machination, uh, perhaps. Uh, but essentially, the emergent response is potentially a free agent. It could go either way. Es especially ontologically at the start, it can. And so you can get a... Anyway. Um, and so the stimulus is like Zion. Uh you know, it really is an independent node. But at the beginning, according to the emergent response, it could be regarded as a kind of, uh, as just a pressure re release valve. Um, until the emergent response is properly aligned with the primary counteroffer. Um in its alignment with the stimulus. So that this really is the question of how integrated can the subconscious be? Can the subconscious integrate with the primary counter offer and then can that integrate with the emergent response and anchor it? And that last link is always exists in some tenuous beginning developmental state and it takes a, a while to develop. Um, A kind of uh, honesty as well I, I would say between these things so um, so what I think is happening here okay, so I, I want to say this thing about bipolar but I also want to say this thing about um, That the emergent response, I think, can be like a sanctuary of refuge away from the failed attempt to properly integrate these other things. Um, and I think usually what ends up happening as well is you can also get the emergent response colonizing the primary counteroffer and the subconscious is just a complete wreck. It's just, well, it, it's isolated as it were. Um, but that can also be a useful developmental step because then you can still have memory and recourse as to how the emergent response and the primary counteroffer function in tandem you can kind of access dynamics you you can explore a kind of spectrum of variability and and functionality between those two um, so yeah i mean I don't think that it's possible to just unplug from the circuitry. I think so this is forcing me to have to go back and, and, and repeat some of my sort of um, models of of um, of therapy of which I already have recordings about specifically uh but um yeah I'd, I'd rather not talk about that now but um so anyway I, I think that these things are in a kind of particularized drama in a particular individual they're in a particular state it's not 
it's not easy. And in some sense, I think you know more about the health or the condition of these emotional tones or the positioning of them um, by seeing the contortions of the pathways that inter interlink them. That that is where you're going to see the real egregious cognitive dissonance. And when cognitive dissonance is, is occurring, it's that there is a particular dominance at odds between these three factions. You, you, you've got a war between, you know, two ganging up on, on one. And then maybe kind of schismatically switching into other kinds of alliances and, and divisions, almost like strategies. And then, you know, if you had that, you would have a kind of um, identity dysregulation. I, I want to say as well that um, that also I think that you can get configurations of alliances between these things, but they actually have beneath that, undergirding those seeming alliances, you have a very rigid hierarchy or power structure. And from that basis, you there, there has been a kind of tactical deployment of further disguises and in these disguises as well you've probably also developed further configurations and these different mock-ups of constellated identity can go to war with one another they can um You know, the one can give the one constellation can give another constellation permission to try itself out, and then suddenly that tried itself out and turned out to be way more powerful and enveloped and destroyed the former, or at least uh, revised and um, reconstituted the the um, the epistemological sense of self. And the other self was just lost to a kind of ontological iteration of development. Anyway, I think all of these things also give one a certain gauntlet through which to walk in order to eventually supersede and transcend and essentially see the the axles that produce the potential pivots and changes. Um, anyway, so I, I do think that this model has a lot of value in it like that. Um, what is my... I just want to say some other general things. Um, Um, so I think the reason why until the subconscious and the primary counter offer create some kind of pathway connection between themselves some kind of environmental stability or some kind of um personal enculturation in terms of their own psyche and psychological schema, if I can put it like that, some kind of anchorage into some metatype supported rubric and, and sort of uh, uh, regular habitual flow of cogniting, valence of cogniting, they, um, 
there is nothing for the emergent response to associate with, even if it is not integrated. But because it can't associate with a properly constituted pair of stimulus and primary counter offer, it's always just a kind of kite in the wind that has no um, kite string attached to it. It it has no uh, it it has no foot on the ground. It's just it's being taken by the wind, as it were. And it can because because essentially the the moving target of that well the stimulus might be might be even characteristically stylized and particular and the primary counter offer might be particularly st stylized and particular as an emotional tone but because these emotional tones are not pathed and welded or, or um, uh, uh, um, connected and because perhaps the individual psyche itself has not worked out the potential of building that bridge on the fly so in some sense, the, the, the user of, of, of the false ego complex, until they can know that they can independently generate pathways of connectivity between their emotional tones, they are going to be utterly enslaved by, let's say, the karma of their environment. Um, they're not going to have a, a, a anything close to even the capability of, of agency or self-mastery. Um, they're going to be an absolute slave to external energy, as it is stated. Uh, uh, as it is, you know, that's a topic that is described often in Scientology, um, as well. And this might be another way of modeling that. Um, Of modeling that general principle in in a, in a particular psychological um, model. Okay. Um, are those all the general things that I want to say? Uh, so there is a there is some kind of consistent drama between these emotional tones. So it's not just. Me, me, mechanics and also these emotional tones are all different in that they're going to have a non you know not all emotional tones are equal they have a different let's say synergistic holistic manifested manifested expression or or you know the you know the the whole structure is 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 I mean it looks it's symmetrical left to right but it's not symmetrical top to bottom you know it, it's um well you know on some structural level it's symmetrical but as soon as you put in alchemical elements or anything anything where you're actually looking at the content it's not symmetrical so I just want to point that out that it's it's um it's unique in a um it's peculiar it 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 it's subtly uh, um, distinct so anyway those are, okay so um, let me just move on now um, okay now I'm going to describe what I think uh, is happening in bipolar so I said that my emergent response is worried or silly now I think that what is what makes someone bipolar type 1 is that they have the same kind of double circuit as this and the second emergent response that is silly, to me, that almost doesn't make sense. The silly does not make sense. And that's the point, is that it doesn't make sense according to the primary counter offer. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work according to the primary counter. If my emergent response to my primary counter offer um, expresses silly instead of worried, I am, I believe I am creating a virtual primary counter offer if I express silly. If I express silly, I would think that that is going to tend towards 
precipitating an excited primary counteroffer because the excited primary counteroffer would be because and, and let me say this as well because annoyed annoyed and excited have a symmetry they they both have the the circle symbol which is the symbol for air both excited and annoyed are both air anyway and you see like i am This is a level of, of speculation at this point, but you see both silly and excited and worried and annoyed are made up of well, they're both made up of sattvaic elements, but annoyed is is actually a proper sattvaic emotional tone, whereas silly and excited are both rajasic emotional tones. But they, rajasic emotional tones, include at least one sattvaic element. So they both have a sattvaic element. And so if I am excited, I am actually endorsing a sattvaic element, although it is based in a rajasic dominant or primary component. Four is the air of rajas 13 is the heir of sattva and so if i am silly it's going to precipitate a potential towards being excited in my primary counter offer which is supposedly not my primary counter offer so I'm, I have created a, it's as if Neo has potentially created a, a second Zion within the matrix out of his own imagination or a virtual, uh, no, I mean, it, it's like creating a, um, you know, because he can fly in the matrix and he can do crazy things, you know, towards the end of the movie and, and, and things like that, that he just sort of creates Zion inside. It, 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 it's, um, so I think that what happens is that you use silly, that seems to be fine because somehow the silly can also be roped back into the annoyed. Silly can feed back to the annoyed. It just has to go through the alchemical symmetry bridge back to the primary counter offer. But I think that the unconscious side of the mind can play, let's say, a dirty trick where it, it can create a false imprint. Or rather, the subconscious can play a dirty trick of creating a false imprint of the unconscious side of the mind. And then you've got a, a keg, you've got a separate storage unit of container that is being fed silly energy, or maybe even a copy of the silly energy, or of the silly emo of impressions from the silly emotional tone. Until you've got enough energy in that storage unit to emerge an excited primary counter offer to displace the the annoyed primary counter offer and then you've got a major magic a major manic episode and you've got a counterbalance to your unconscious side of the mind you've got potentially a um a new emergent um uh
don't even know what what to call it but i would say that the the issue would be is is because you can have multiple pathways i mean this isn't i don't see there being necessarily a problem with with having multiple pathways the issue is simply which pathway is going to um be used to process and digest and to come up uh with an emergent response and the only problem with the other personality is how is it going to co um, correspond with the other emergent response which is used to feeding the other primary counter offer is the new emergent pathway going to be able to equally draw from both emergent responses and also is it going to be equally proficient at uh, corresponding or integrating with if you have a full double circuit like i do what what the um Uh, the stimulus responses and um, I just wanted to say that um, anyway I, I probably have to refine this and think on it some bit but that's that's basically the the, the mass of the overview and uh, it's a bit embarrassing because this has not been refined and it's not been fully interpreted um, and I do need to think about it more but I did also wanted to produce something um, because I know some people are, are very interested in this. Um, and perhaps they'll ask me questions that will precipitate, <laughs> hopefully, a, 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 a less confused and a, and a more comprehensive um, output. But uh, I want to say as well that... Um, <laughs> this is a stupid point, but a long time ago I said, oh, I think my circuitry has got... An emotional tone in each field circuit and then i contra and then i said no it doesn't it only has three but it it does have one in in each so i do actually have an emotional tone in each field circuit according to this so i guess it just shows you how many clerical errors i can end up making um But yeah, I mean, I always feel very embarrassed giving, showing things like this because it's, um, you know, I mean, I imagine that on some levels it can just be look like it's it's just been so contrived and manufactured and that it, it just is made to look, <laughs> it's made to look un, undecipherable so that I can just say whatever I want and that this is all an elaborate hoax or some shit like that. I mean, I, I you know, I, I hope that people don't... Um, Anyway, but uh, and uh, I should, I guess, for for posterity, I should say this because, uh, and this is this is a horrible thing to say, but. Um, I still won't be happy until I've reversed metagram circuitry to the point at which I can rediscover the choice that I made. Because at some point, I could have generated double the metagram types, but I stopped. Sorry, not double, another 24. I could have gone from 48 to 72. And I didn't go from 48 to 72 because I said that those permutations, those metagram circuits, I, I called them non sequitur. I said that they would be impossible. You would never be able to have um, a, a psychological schema that operates like th that. that. That circuit would not be operable. And I even, I even considered that perhaps that those those things were perhaps kind of like maybe angel circuits that they were sort of things that happened not between individual intelligences but happened as a kind of co-mingling of environmental karmic anthropomorphization in how i've defined it in in this lecture 
uh, or, or, or this discussion over my research. Um, this discussion with myself. But um, that with certain environmental, uh, let's say, collaboration, that over time you get enough sort of shared psychological environment with enough other people in an organization or a group that you get certain emotional tones co-present that they just kind of go through their own catalytic sort of conversion or their own sort of... Uh, chemical reaction and that that essentially could be what those missing 24 were um, or and this is something which I almost don't want to say because it, it's something that I don't even understand the full impact of, of what I'm going to say um, and I don't even understand how, how I would start to or if that in those 24 things that if I had that, if there wasn't a second configuration of these emotional tones, that if there wasn't more than one of these, that I'm one of these models of these of this 12 extraction from the 17 with the 24 emotional tones, maybe somehow there's a halfway thing where it has half of these emotional tones plus another half or it has just a completely different configuration and both of these things are possible templates or something like that but that is that is a wild speculation and if i say that i don't even know how uh, yeah anyway I'd, i just like being I, mean, I guess you know when i'm putting in this many safety latches on my thinking it's um certainly embarrassing if, if not um, looking like someone who's, who's desperately afraid to be proven uh, I can't even think of an intelligent uh, end to that sentence or afraid to be proven that uh, or, or, or afraid to be disproven uh, that that the model was um, was sort of missing half of itself or, or uh, you know sort of radically incomplete and, and that uh, you know I only managed to sort of excavate you know with, with all of my things a particular sort of thing. I mean Anyway, you know, unknown unknowns are always abound and surround. Um, but anyway, uh, okay, well, that, that's about the state of things, which is, uh, it's not a happy state. Um, it's not a... Uh, um, It's not frightfully useful, uh, but I haven't been looking to, to, to find ways to make it useful. I've been looking to find ways to make it uh, stand up and, uh, and at least match up w w w with my own theory, which is something that, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not pretty. But I think I'm making progress, and I think it's it's going somewhere. Oh, and I, I should add one more point about cerebral histrionics. Um, I think what cerebral histrionics are doing, and this will also make a separate connected point, what I think cerebral histrionics are doing 
is that cerebral histrionics are more like borderlines than they are like narcissists. And the reason why they associate with narcissists is because they are providing a kind of Oedipal mother. I've, I've actually borrowed this term from Heldo uh, from his presentation uh, that I watched. I think it's, uh, it's such a beautiful motif and, and sort of archetype to draw on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, because I, I do see this as a thread in terms of the thing that has traumatized narcissists and the thing that borderlines try to do in order to decompartmentalize their targets and and try to you know create a codependent you know sort of um uh sort of uh, uh unilateral reality tunnel so i think that cerebral Cerebral um, histrionics, sorry, did I say cerebral narcissists? I meant to say cerebral histrionic, if I did. I think what cerebral histrionics are doing is that they, I think that they are, are almost always acting in bad faith. They, you know, I, even if they are slightly unaware about it, I think that they know that there's a kind of bad faith there because when I say that they're unaware about it, they're only unaware because they think that that's what intellectualism is. They've just copied other people. They have, um, you know, that's what the smart, that's what the cool kids or that's what the, you know, the, the people with high status that, that were called intellectuals by their peers, or something, you know, like somehow they got into this kind of game of prestige or, or, or something like that. Um, okay, so, so, but, but I mean, that, that, that premise, I think, might make them unaware, but that doesn't save them from, uh, from, from not being perpetrators of bad faith. And I think that the, they know the, they know exactly the name of their game. And essentially, they like narcissists because narcissists are true believers. Narcissists actually believe and because they depend on narcissistic supply, which means they need some kind of rigor or some kind of structure that can supply them with narcissistic supply and cerebral histrionics like to be the machinists and the constructors of such a culture or such a structure or a system so they like the idea of constructing the oedipal mother of the environment of the status hierarchy or something like that they like the idea of sort of you know by committee designing the status hierarchy in some sense, or at least the, the criteria of what is taken to be intellectual or true or, or real or, or some, they've, they've created some false authority or some external locus of authority that they have the credentials to speak on behalf of and be the regents thereof. So it's all about regency over some important intellectual commodity. And that they are the representative of this token authority that, that has this same, same power as a kind of, um, that really is some kind of external locus of control or narrative. Um, and, you know, these things are usually disguised by, essentially, no one cares about substantiation, no one cares about real justification. They only care about how good is, does your excuse sound? Give me a nice sounding excuse. And we are of the domain. We are of the culture where we take these excuses as being good enough and, and we scapegoat these other excuses. We don't accept them. And so it's all about our consolation prizes are better than your consolation prizes. It's all about slave morality. That's another way of, of describing these things. But anyway, um, but essentially, they know that it's a consolation game. 
and they revel in the construction of it. They think that that's all there is to do, that that's what intellectualism means. It's almost a kind of vestigial status, culturally defined, you know, it's almost postmodern in all of its fundamental sensibilities. It doesn't believe in anything. It's just a kind of semantic Tower of Babel. Um, Anyway, anyway, um, what is what is the point? Uh, my point is is that cerebral histrionics are like bad. Fi oh. Yeah, so I think that they're almost on the spectrum of borderline, and they will even go the whole way. I think they can even do everything that a borderline can do. They can do, they just do it by more exact. They are almost like. I can't think of an elegant way of putting it. Um, I have to think of an analogy, probably, because I, I can't technically describe it. But it's it's almost as if they were tutored honestly by a borderline in how the borderline perpetrates social manipulation, and. They have imprinted themselves on, on how to play those so it's it's sophistry. It's a kind of sophist is a kind of inducted sophistry. Anyway, um why did I want to say this? I just wanted to say this because I was actually going to I so I wanted to actually do this right at the beginning of the recording. I I but then I went straight into it. Um I wanted to talk about this because in the at the end of the last recording, I had just talked about narcissism and I had talked about borderline and I wanted to talk about cerebral histrionic and make a distinction. But now I don't know if I can even remember all the things I was saying about narcissism and borderline. But I also wanted to add another point, which I did touch on, but I, I just wanted to emphasize it again, is the idea of connectedness between these pathways between the emotional tones that exist that um, I made, made like five pages of notes of things that I wanted to say, and I didn't say any of those things, and I just went into this latest stuff. But, sorry, um, this was all... Uh, let me find those. Okay, so that I must say... Let me just quick... Oh, damn, this is only one page. One of the other pages. I didn't talk about that, but I don't think I need to. I, I was I was speculating on modes of clearing up ambiguity between the grimmers and um, and also a more precise technical theory of feedback uh, or, or mirror of uh, indirect sympathy and anterior and posterior uh, direct. Um, induction. It's, it's almost an oxymoron direct induction. Um, or, or just, I guess knock on direct. Anyway, um, yeah, I 
have to work out some stable jargon for this stuff. Um, okay, that's that was two pages. Where's three and four? One, two. Oh yeah, so I was talking. Yeah, you know, the that was almost the, I did touch on this quite a bit. You know, the the connections and connect that pe that people need a kind of uh, they perhaps in some stage of development need to be able to indulge in a kind of confabulation in order to help them connect to themselves uh, requires a certain amount of affection from others' tones to support even their dishonesty. And I, I mean this in, in a inverted commas dishonesty in terms of a kind of reality dishonesty. You know, it's kind of like the, um, I'm sure there's, there's developmental writers that talk about sort of stages of development that, um, that there's perhaps a kind of magical thinking which is almost like a glue which is needed in order to traverse the broadness of the field of the emotional tone uh, of, of, of the whole model. Because if you don't, because you have the emotional tones that you have, but the other emotional tones that you have, you have to experience, you have to learn about, you have to, but you can't, you can't really explore them unless you can indulge in some magical thinking because your emotional tone forces you to treat them a certain way. So without a certain amount of latitude, you're going to confine yourself to only rigid pathways. You're not going to be able to broaden your scope of what's going on in all the different fields. There's four on the other side. No, it's not on the other side of this. Okay, I'm missing four. Um, and I think that <laughs> this is slightly speculative, but um, I, I think that this might be what a lot of people are stuck in in terms of their development. Is is maybe that they're stuck in that limbo of that stage of kind of dishonesty and confabulation because they've never created a stable integration between their stimulus and their primary counter offer, or at least if they have, their emergent response tries to deny that they have. And so there isn't, because there's one thing to have an integrated emergent response. It's another thing to have the emergent response pretend as if your stimulus and primary counter offer have never integrated, because then the emergent response can sort of play a kind of half wit game of sort of bad faith. Or, or, you know, sort of profane nescience, etc., etc., which are tools in the arsenal of both the borderline and the cerebral histrionic. What is... Okay, can I really not find page number four? Okay, anyway, I'll just go to, go to page number five. Um... Oh, yeah, so when I was saying that, like, the emergent response is, em the emotional tone of the emergent response is going to operate differently on this model, according, uh, differently to the stimulus and the primary counteroffer, I believe, in that the emergent response is almost going to have an ionic influence and kind of a magnetic, an ionic magnetism that is going to, potentially polarize the pathways of the whole model, perhaps. But the stimulus and the primary counter offer can integrate between each other under that kind of ionic umbrella that is 
being showered onto them from the emergent response. Now, the thing that makes that weird is that the emergent response is essentially, now, I, I, I'm not exactly sure about this because I haven't reverse engineered every single mesogram type and, and seen what's going on there. But I think generally speaking, a lot of types, the emergent response is on the same line as the primary counter offer. It's just the other one. I haven't seen, I haven't done my homework here properly. I haven't looked up to see if there are any types that explicitly do, because I can kind of work this out mathematically by using the emotional tones and alchemical definitional components as identities. I could work out if there must be a pairing between someone's, some circuit's primary counter offer and some circuit's emotional tone Sorry, and, and another uh, and the same circuit's emergent response to work out if they're ever distinctly not the same. So it might be possible, even without fully reverse engineering the, the metagram, to have that question answered if these things are ever actually separated, like mine are, and I'm the, and and I say that I believe that that's what produces me being by bi potentially bipolar type one and having an emergent virtual primary counter offer essentially almost having a separate it's, it's not completely separate because the subconscious is still the same the stimulus is still the same but the the actual major manic episode is probably going to be an event that is not going to be registered in terms of metatype so much is is whatever is happening in terms of metatype is just going to be a symptom of what's happening on this model in in metagram pathways but uh, what i was saying is is that yeah so i'm not sure if 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 it if it's true that the primary counter offer and the emergent response is always on the same line or if there are some types where it is very decidedly not on the same line. But essentially, what that also implies that if it is always on the same line, it implies that the emergent response is always at odds with the primary counter offer, which would make sense because the ego is both dependent on the super ego, which the primary counter offer is also. A mask of of the super ego but it's also oh I, I need to talk about this this is another this is something that that i came up with and i think it's fairly stable as well this is also a little bit of a, a tiny breakthrough i should have put this at the start is that you can actually take each two sides of the mind that are adjacent to one another and consider that the, that the proceeding side of the mind is always the amalgamation of the two preceding sides of the mind. And therefore, you, you, you get into considering that the ego and the superego combined as the subconscious Although that's perhaps the trickiest one because the ego and the superego have an asymmetrical 
are, are not are divided essentially and the super ego and the subconscious are not divided they 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 are as fluid as they come but obviously it's also slightly unique because the super ego is then the beginning of the entire chain because it's sort of kind of stands alone in this way that it's really sort of the, the beginning point. So the superego and the subconscious combined is the unconscious, which is this kind of, oh, I don't know what the unconscious is. It's called the unconscious. It's this environmental experience that involves this mystery of life. And then the, um, the subconscious and the unconscious combined is the ego, and then the ego and the unconscious combined is the superego. And semantically and thematically and how I've described the contents of these sides of the mind, that just works so darn well. I'm pretty amazed at just how well that works. And... It can also give you a certain clue as to, I could call it the bias that is going to be impregnated within the metagram pathway model in terms of how these emotional tones could be seen as needing to correspond with one another in order to reproduce each other. that the primary counteroffer and the emergent response combined is going to somewhat equate to the stimulus. And the stimulus and the primary counteroffer combined has to equate to the emergent response. Because the primary counter offer both represents the super ego and and the unconscious. Um, and let's say that the hidden dharmic element is that you are never fully locked into your emotional tone circuitry in the sense that you at least have the latitude in terms of the pillars of the final five that are the source of mental grammar that is creating, that is the stuff that you are creating the emotional tone idolatry out of. I, I must say as well that I was listening you know, to this Frank Herbert Dune stuff and there's a beautiful YouTube channel uh, called Quint. I think it's called. Oh, I can't remember the name of the YouTube channel, but he's he's got a sub component of the channel uh, that he calls Quinn's Ideas, and you know he's really got marvelous content on on Dune. And anyway, but you know in the lore of Dune, it's it's you know in the Butlerian Jihad as it's called, they have you know this futuristic religion. They say thou shalt not make a human intelligence in. But what one shall, what thou shalt not make, I can't remember the, the 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 actual commandment, but it's something like thou shalt not make artificial intelligence in the image of of the of the human mind, or or thou shalt not make a machine mind in the image of human intelligence, something like that. Um. Which is actually a. I would argue a much better understanding of the commandment of thou shalt not make a graven image of the Lord thy God. Um, I can't actually remember what the actual commandment is. I think it's longer than that. It might also talk about and the angels or something. But um,
was just that you will have no graven images before the Lord thy God, I think. Anyway, so I was never a huge scholar of... Uh, The Old Testament, um, apart from uh, Zachiel and Samuel. You know, all the other books of Kings and um, all the stuff that was written by Samuel. Anyway, um, these equations are... Is that everything? What was I saying? Uh, the stimulus. So yeah, I mean, it seems to me that it's likely that the primary counter often the emergent response are weirdly at odds with each other, but also weirdly on the same team in 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 another half respect. And so this makes the emergent response Man, what can I say? See, it, it, I guess I don't even have it straightened out in my own head that well because it's... See, like, when the subconscious is connected, you know, like, when, when I talk about the two circuits in Metatype, it's not these, these pathways in Metagram. In Metatype, the subconscious is connected directly to, to the ego and the unconscious is directed connectly to the to the super ego but the super ego unconscious isn't a solid loop like the subconscious like the subconscious ego is the subconscious ego circuit perfectly fluidly circulates between itself in terms of its metatype construction whereas the unconscious superego Is, is that the unconscious is being fed from, from the subconscious and, 
and it's feeding into the ego. And when I say it's fed from and feeding into, If I was talking about the un, uh, if I was talking about the subconscious and the ego and how they're connected to each other because they feed into the unconscious and the super ego, and then the other the other one correspondingly feeds from the un, uh, the unconscious or the super ego, they're using the territory of the other side of the mind as just a kind of way station relay. Whereas. And, and when they use that as a way station relay, I think it could, could be seen as that they are creating the limit of when they create a relay through another side of the mind. They are limiting that side of the mind, they're capping it, they're putting certain impositions against that sphere of operation. They're adding layers into the inferior function so that that local side of the mind that they're using as a relay station will ignore what's going on. So that's what the ignoring function, that's what the inferior function is, is doing. But when the unconscious is feeding into the ego, and the super ego is feeding from the ego, they're not feeding to and feeding from the same cognitive function. So there's no actual connection. Those, the, it isn't a relay. It's just a terminal point, a terminal end and a terminal beginning, a terminal end for the unconscious and a terminal beginning for the super ego. So that circuit has an actual iteration has a real cycle. In fact, it's the only source of internal time, I could even say. Um, but it usually gives up that time to the unconscious, but not but but, uh, uh, but for the for the unconscious to um, to serve to uh, I guess both the ego, but probably also um, the subconscious, in terms of how the subconscious, each side of the mind, I think, ends up in imprinting some model of each other, what, what each other side of the mind is doing, at least in terms of how it corresponds to the things that it is already monitoring or tracking the things that it cares about and values according to its child local child function. So What was I just saying? So the subconscious is born out of 
the super ego's inferior function. Although it's arguable if if the, if the super ego really has an inferior function, it might just kind of be a, a baited hook or something like that. Um, because the super ego gets to bully the, the ego as much as it wants because of this non-functional relay that it has with the unconscious side of the mind going through the ego. So the ego is, is somewhat prone to the super ego's, um, say, unilateral fiat. But... But it has to, it has to represent a united front vis-a-vis -vis the unconscious side of the mind, which is in some sense the disguise or the mask or the actual front shop of the superego, although it is its own side of the mind. It has its own, but it's that independence in some sense, I would argue, does only make sense in connection with the subconscious itself. In conjunction or in tandem with, with with the subconscious, so I think that you can jailbreak the unconscious side of the mind fairly easily. The question is: is how well can you integrate that with the subconscious? Essentially, um, the unconscious was almost designed to be jailbroken. Um, it's like the oracle in the Matrix. She has lots of special children. Um, she likes her special children. Um, what's the point? Uh, And I think that the superego itself. Oh, damn, I wrote this down. Yeah, this is probably an important point to make. So I know the pace of this is going very bad, but these might be important things to add. Um, I think that maybe the way of thinking of what the superego is, is that it is the identity in the world. The superego is literally the identification of some... So, so, yeah, so, um, so, because, uh, you know, in, in, in very early development, you have children that don't have a sense of self, they are the world, they are the mother, they are everything that they experience, they are the room, as it were. I don't know if I really believe that too much, actually. I, I, don't, I think that's a bit of an oversimplification, but let's just go with something like that. Um, let's say the set of perceived things that are happening, the experience of whatever is happening is identified as uh, um, I guess they would call it a pseudo self until you actually have constructed a conceptual self 
that can weigh that pseudo self of experiences okay so and i think that there is a proto ego that has the amalgamation of an unconscious and subconscious implicit within it that is a kind of guiding um, Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think in very young children that there might be even, maybe even even then a primary counter offer and an emergent response, but without an established s stimulus, but a kind of maybe that is what signals the actual crystallization of a particular metagram type. That there's a kind of duality between the primary counter off and the and the emo and the emergent response, but it can kind of it's not necessarily fixated, or perhaps it's it, it, it's not affixed into any particular line. It can sort of migrate around. And it's the sort of, it's the stimulus which is unknown, which has to kind of be, which is an emergent property of running that particular sort of proto-psychological schema. Anyway, um... But... Perhaps more concretely, perhaps the young child is a primary counter offer without an emergent response uh, that they're kind of self aware about. They're kind of literally acting out the emergent response as a, as a direct input of whatever sort of primary counter offer that they are channeling at the time. That they're experiencing their own primary counter offer and then they are just literally knee-jerk responding with the corresponding emergent response And their subconscious is a, is a is not present on the metagram pathway model. Their subconscious is a fluid oceanic stream of of sort of corresponding beliefs that amount or commentary on that primary counter offer emergent response sort of diode or dyad of of you know sort of of experience that is both experiential and mental as a, as a mental component of 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 an experience of a knee jerk response uh, to an environmental stimuli of the identity of, of 
the and eventually the subconscious develops enough semantic confidence to label and to perhaps even in, involute itself in an external locus of control where it can even say, well, this ability to have an oceanic or more oceanic understanding of the world, a more broad, dreamlike way of interpreting the world, that it's the... Um, is when the subconscious gets pinned down by the image of an emotional tone that then you are set into the false ego. That's when sort of the nail on the coffin is, is hammered in. But that's also, let's say, a necessary evil to... gear towards um how, how to describe it uh unlocking the mystery of the super ego because without having a pinned down subconscious you can never disambiguate how the subconscious is orchestrating it itself off of the remnant of the of the superego because the subconscious is structured out of the inferior function of the superego so the subconscious has to learn that it's a it's being toyed with by the superego but that's not possible until it can self-identify itself as a component part so that it can have some experience that it can track what that thing has, what has happened to that thing. As you could call it a kind of involution, a necessary involution to be a kind of litmus test or a kind of indicator as to its own captivity that it's otherwise oblivious to. Um, So, and there's a kind of self-satisfaction between the primary counter-offer and the emergent response that only, let's say, the, um, the arduous task of development and integration between that and the stimulus is a necessary component to working through, perhaps, the... Uh, getting the oversight over these pathways. And I do think that there might be a way in which the, this model could be used without people knowing their exact metagram type. Because, well, I mean, I'd probably have to describe all these things a bit better. But essentially, I knew that I had a certain aversion to certain emotional tones because now you see this is tricky because actually maybe I'm muddling this up I would I would even say that it was for sort of meta morality reasons that certain emotional tones are more toxic than others I do think that you could make an argument actually no so what I was about to say I have just scuttled my own point actually quite badly but um but I think that the, oh, okay well and let me change my point entirely. Um, gaining mastery over the, the metagram pathways might perhaps be able to be garnered independently of knowing your own metagram type, but knowing perhaps that you have one maybe can be, well, I guess, no, that wouldn't be that helpful unless you knew particularly what it was. But um, if you could master each pathway or something like that, would be helpful and also know the dynamics and the specifics of, of the different sort of meta moral implications of certain pathways like 
one pathway that I think is very, very important is any pathway that has six in it, because six um, eminence, the salt, is a very dangerous. I, I think that the whole... find the diagram that has the names of the emotional tones on it. Condescending, bored, those, and lazy and calm, those have six in them. And I think that there is actually a, and condescending and bored are mirrored and silly and excited. Silly and condescending are correspondent, and excited and bored are correspondent. Um, through final five uh, simultaneous activation, although that's slightly sort of theoretical, speculative. Um, So uh, the reason why I mentioned the other side as well is because uh, I also, I guess, shy and relaxed is going to correspond with lazy and calm. It's not. That's not a correspondent. <laughs> uh, lazy and calm is going to have a correspondence with terrified and lonely. So six has an influence over, okay, is directly involved with condescending bored. It's, it's then mirrored to silly and excited. And then it's also alchemically parallel, although inversely parallel to lazy and calm is inversely parallel to terrified and lonely. Oh, man, I'm actually forgetting the point uh, that I thought about it about six, that, that six is, um, I think that all, all the corruption of these things can, of, of the, the corruption of this pathway model itself, because this is the kind of anthropomorphization of the intellect. Um, that the only reason why this is able to um, get corrupted is because the salt is, uh, is corrupt, essentially. And when the salt gets corrupt, it's like the whole thing is just uh, fundamentally bad. And so I think that there's a kind of, there's a necessary, um,
it's, it's like a temper, temperamental gate that is going to stop you. I mean, six, the cognitive function six, I call my one word for it is eminence. And you can see this everywhere, that um, people will not listen to wise words if they do not proceed from the mouth of someone that has enough standing in eminence. Eminence is a currency. It is, and, and so I think, and you can see that it precipitates the emotional terms, condescending and bored. You know, people don't have the patience. They don't, and I think to, to overcome this problem, you really have to do the via negativa, the, the, the hate is necessary to cleanse the hating everything, including your own life, so that you have something to, to have clear vision of things, so that you're looking for real substantiation and justification. I think if you're being silly, there's an implicit kind of condescending that's happening there. And if you're being excited, you're also being bored. But I mean, bored is, perhaps I'm not reading this perfectly yet, but I think that it's okay to be bored. Because if you're bored, that means that you can at least move on, you can move forward. Because if you're bored, you're giving... 13 enough energy perhaps to go be annoyed about something and if you're annoyed about something then you're perhaps giving 17 enough energy to go be calm about something and so by the way i think that how you resolve each of these little circles is that you have to be the second one not the first one if you are the first one it's like it's not bad to be the first one because you might be honestly responding to something that needs attention that you need to process you need to digest, that you need to work through, that you need a solution for, or you need some kind of conciliation or reconciliation about. So essentially the, the close ones are the stagnant ones or the negative ones, and the far, the far ones are the positive emotional tones. And the positive emotional tones aren't necessarily positive if they are leading to a further stagnation. But if they are all in the positive camp, I think that that will precipitate a kind of movement, a fluidity. You know, the Chinese talk about that chakra must move. You must have, the chakra must be flowing, it mustn't be stagnant. And so I think that that's all these things are, are either stagnant or flowing, but the but stagnation is, is not necessarily wrong if it's for a reason, as it were, that needs to, that, I mean, you know, this is, um, this is a dead model. It's not going to be the, the answer to morality. It's not an absolute morality, but it is a, um, it is something like a, 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 I don't know what they call it, things that measure the depths of things, a dipstick or something. Um, and so it can be used intelligently perhaps with some kind of diagnosis but it's not going to be the final diagnosis in and of itself it's going to need interpretation essentially and discerning on top of that but um, my point here is that um, my point here is that point um oh yeah so i just wanted to tell a model about what happiness might be in terms of this model because there's no happiness described anywhere here and the ideal state of each of these field circuits within these pathways so i think that the ideal state is to be some aspect of angry and some aspect of lonely and some 
aspect of anxious and to be chosen of that and to be chosen of some aspect of eager and some aspect of elated and some aspect of relieved but to not be dishonest about one's own eager sorry rushed or sad or scared emotional tones and obviously the real killer is or the real problem is is when one has a set emotional tone which is a fixture which one is propelling or imposing because which can be both you can have positive emotional tones which i mean this might be the difference between introverts and extroverts or in scientology it might be the difference between occluded cases as well and not occluded cases but anyway that's uh, okay, so I think, yeah, I think that's everything that, that I wanted to cover. Um, cool. Yeah, it's a bit messy and I, I need to start speculating more perhaps and and more vividly get into details about how i see these things working with the emergent response and stimulus and, and primary counter offer but that also requires me to do some proper secretary work in reformatting some of my old tables of data from metagram circuitry and processing them to make sure that, that it looks like that everything is going according to what I expected it. Um, and it's consistent with what I've already said, but I'm uh, pretty sure I was exhaust, exhaustive with all my speculative variants. I think I have. Anyway. A oh, very long recording. I can just only apologize for that okay i'm going to continue to double down on my sort of embarrassing speculation and try to amass as much of a, a messy state of affairs as possible so that i can have a broad palette to refine and to uh whittle away from i guess so uh yeah, there, there were a small list of things that, that I wanted to sort of pile on. Um, so, uh, another thing which I want to speculate about, which is that the difference in personality between the genders, I think, are perhaps explained that... Um, and I might even have this inverted, maybe, and maybe it's backwards to this, but I mean, I, uh, this is my strong sort of sentiment or whatever, is that the difference, the stereotypical difference or the archetypal difference between men and women is that women, if it is true that the emergent response and the primary counter offer is always on the same line, and that is like ninety percent of all circuits have that positioning. If there, if maybe it's every circuit, maybe it's a hundred. All circuits have that positioning, except for the the most complicated double circuits, which which have a secondary emergent response, which is an alternative emergent response, which is in some sense a mirror, a uh, um, a, a reflection of the emergent the in some sense the prime the, the the emergent response which is directly related to the primary counter offer so the the second emergent response or the alternative emergent response is um you know leads to this problem of developing also a virtual pri primary offer um if if it's kind of overused or if it's used in such a way that doesn't cycle its way back doesn't feed its way back or communicate its way back to the primary counter offer and flow through it, it can start to sort of develop perhaps an ulterior structure or, or kind of in, in, in uh, a cocoon of, of some 
ulterior sort of constellation of of you know sort of you know almost a robust persona or at least some large part of of a separate persona or something like that or a kind of al alternative framework that would at least be an alternative ego framework and al an alternative ego judgment an alternative source of ego judgment or um anyway uh that if it is true that the primary counter offer and the emergent response is always on the same line, then I, I'm speculating that what maybe makes, that what we consider to be a kind of the quintessential female personality, you know, sort of style, is that, and, and obviously mascul masculinity is, is also going to have to at some point develop this, but it's maybe that the, it's a difference in emphasis and maybe slightly in order as well in terms of when it's developed that that these things perhaps it matters which one gets developed before the other one because then there's a kind of it changes a kind of the pathway dependency it changes the pathway hierarchy of utilization or import so the flow chart is looks different and so anyway, my idea is, is that the feminine personality style tries to settle its primary counter offer and, and an emergent response within the pool of its field circuit. Where, so because the primary counter offer and emergent response is going to be on the same line in a single field circuit, like most of the time, except for those odd types that have a secondary emergent response that is found elsewhere elsewhere and I haven't done all my secretarial work uh, to confirm if if everyone's primary counter offer um, is on is is on the same line falls between the same two cognitive functions in the, the same field circuit so I haven't double checked that but it's going to be at least half of them but probably the vast majority of them um, so I know that that's that's an embarrassing thing to even to be speculating on the basis of but anyway but essentially what I'm imagining is, is that a field circuit is made up of three lines, six emotional tones, three cognitive functions. Um, obviously those three cognitive functions are also going to have mirrors to other field circuits as well. Two types of mirrors, you know, the, um, the final five um, source of conscious grammar, you know, is, is sort of... Um, simultaneous moments of, of, of cogniting and then also it's going to have alchemical symmetry mirrors all over the place you know vast distances away so you know obviously the mirror ones are always adjacent but the um, uh, the um, The, the mirror ones can almost be seen as, as always being uh, uh, there the mirror the mirror ones between the final five source stuff is essentially touching those lines are almost touching as long as you can believe in the conflation between the two cognitive functions which are displayed in the rectangles. So they're one conflation away from being very well regarded as being the same thing almost in, in some in, in, in relative to the final five kind of thing, or at least similar. That they're being decided simultaneously. They're they're being emulated simultaneously, they're being um, produced simultaneously to some degree. There's a sensitivity as the one is produced that the other one is also produced in tandem the alchemical one i still don't have a proper theoretical basis as how that actually functions in cognition because i to me it's 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 an it's a very abstract correlate i don't necessarily understand why the brain is going to or why the personality or why your own metatype sensibility is going to believe that there is a kind of fundam in fact maybe that's the answer the answer might be that it's not in metagram it's in metatype that 
there is going to be over time a natural affinity between a meta type um, cognitive function uh, of, of, of like you know the inferior function or the dominant function or the child function or, um, or, or the sin that one of these things is going to have a kind of it's going to develop a kind of cadence because all the 12 and also the final five cognitive functions are, are the 17 model and the 17 model is the territory upon which the metatype four sides of the mind structure is overlaid on top of so not only are these cognitive functions existing in metagram as ingredients as alchemical ingredients that have a kind of final five symmetry about them but that they also have a kind of geographical position within because in some sense the 17 model is the hardware of consciousness it is the metaphysics of reality it is the complete metaphysics metagram is a subtraction metagram is a is a is is actually a kind of illusion it's it's you know it's um uh you know uh, maya karma you know it's it's the thing that covers the living thing it's um it's the the conduit of the world uh you know um it's the stuff that the world is made of and it's the medium in which we we um exist um and that we have to learn to overcome that we need victory over but anyway um but essentially i perhaps then that because because there are essentially within the realm of the the objective morality the the meta morality that metagram seems to signify although it's illusory it has a kind of there's a thematic resonance between these cognitive functions that have the same alchemical subcomponents or constituents you take those constituents and over time there is going to be a natural resonance and allegiance between the gi the the, the, the placement of where these are placed within the metatype and so the actual met there's going to be a natural affinity in the metatype structure between these roles so you know and and there is also a rigid almost a kind i mean this was probably what makes life and psychology so fundamentally peculiar and why it's impossible to decipher it without a very sophisticated model like what i've done with my entire life discovering it and 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 plotting it out although sometimes when i look at the stuff i wonder if you know this wasn't discovered by sages you know sort of 50,000 years ago in ancient civilizations that then were you know sort of lost to the eons or something like that um you know, you know when you look at things like the flower of life you wonder why are there 48 circles there you know there are 48 metagram um circuits in my system you know so, but anyway um but maybe they had some sense of it but not the detail who knows but um yeah i'd like to think that maybe this is a rediscovery but who knows um But the point is, is that the, um, that there is a rigid where, for example, uh, if we look at the dark square with the white circle in the middle of it, 15 and one is that, is that symbol and 12 and nine is that symbol. The, the, the line connection between 12 and 9 and the line connection between 15 and 1 is that square. Now, those have the same alchemical constituents, and 15 and 12 are both earth elements, and 9 and 1 are both fire elements. 15 is the earth of Rajas, 12 is the earth of Sattva, 9 is 
the fire of tamas and one is the fire of sattva. And 15 and 12 have either a distance of, uh, I never know how to, how to mention this, if you should include them or not or whatever, but let's just say that there are two dimensions in between 12 and 15, and there are, well, so there are two places in between. So if, if the one was, you see, it, it's kind of uh, different for each metatype. So, you know, uh, f for most types, if uh, either one of them, well, I guess that the lower one, if 12 was on someone's inferior function uh, in one of their sides of the mind, uh, then 15 would be on the parent function. And if uh, 12 was on the dominant function, uh, then 15 would be on the inferior function, and if 12, uh, no wait, I think I'm one out from there, um, and the one and nine, you see the problem is, this is going to be unique to each type, because the overlay isn't perfectly symmetrical, because each side of the mind, the, the ego and the super egos overlap is asymmetrical. So that kind of bungles the regularity that would otherwise, I think, make under, uh, decomposing the components of human cognition, but also certain themes within interaction and psychology, it would have made it decipherable, it would have been cracked if if it was like that, but essentially because these structures are are definitely, re I mean, everyone in typology knows that there's there's some um, there's some recurring uh, uh, you know structure that that, that there is some uh, co common structure, some sort of almost um, metaphysical grammar that is you know and. Um, Anyway, uh, but within a particular metatype, there's going to be a particular correspondence between these metatype roles, which are going to, let's say, naturally perhaps generate content or hold content that is going to be accessible. So perhaps there'll be a natural acclamation towards... Let's, or a bias towards correspondence or a, a kind of a, a correspondence which emerges which has a kind of implicit bias that the content produced by the because these things are all going to be performing different roles they're going to be in different uh, um, metatypes and different metatypes are all going to be in different places but wherever they are placed there's that's going to be a consistent feature of that of that psychology of that personality style and these things are going to be digesting the things that they're going to do according to the role and the task that they are given within whatever corresponding side of the minds that they have. And there's going to be a production of, of content, a, a charge that is being filtered or held or contributed to by these functions, which are going to have a natural affinity in terms of their content. So that's quite an indirect, it, it's, you know, it's weird because that's kind of like using metatype as a bridge for metagram to um, kind of teleport from one side of metagram pathway to another metagram pathway. And if there is such a correspondence, the intermediary pathways are going to have to absorb the shock of that teleportation excuse the analogy, um, if I can just phrase it like that, and, and, and um, let me just move on, but so, anyway, um, man, did I finish the point about, about the characteristic of woman, man, so I almost went, okay, there was a, not a bad uh, tangent, it was kind of on topic, but, um, so, I think, 
what the definition of, of woman uh, is within this kind of psychological stereotype is that they, they have their pri primary counter offer and their emergent response. and within a particular field circuit and they they fortify it within the field circuit within which it's it it, it inhabits so they have a primary counter offer they have an emergent response that's on the same line within a particular field circuit and what they do is they get they actually monitor the neighboring the neighboring components of the same field circuit so they, they fortify their use of emotional tone between their primary counter off and their emergent response within its own field circuit. So they care more about having a replenishing um, uh, sustainable consistency between how their primary counter offer and their emergent response gets into a kind of conciliation that that th th they have a very localized mastery over supporting their primary counter offer and their emergent response and this would mean that because they have a very strongly supported emergent response and primary counter offer they have a kind of roving dominance over using their emergent response and primary counter offers so that essentially they have a very strong unconscious and in conjunction with their ego their unconscious and ego have combined a kind of roving mastery when i say roving i mean because they carry it with them and they it's always it's kind of like an aura that, that they are inputting into the environmental you know uh, you know so, so it's almost like they are they have it on hand to use to utilize and it roves or it, so it's like a, a toolkit but uh, but anyway um anyway maybe it's a bad analogy but uh Kind of makes sense to me but um and this also is perhaps let's say useful from maybe an anthropological kind of social psychology uh, sort of um uh, point of view because if they don't have a strong relationship to their own subconscious they can therefore use this field circuit to gravitate around somebody else's subconscious so they could essentially equally serve this this field circuit that they've got set up could equally serve their own subconscious privately but they could also have it equally serve somebody else's subconscious so that they could kind of mediate because their own psychology isn't fully um uh rigged into an integrated um crystallized you know sort of concretized you know sort of um monolith it's adaptable therefore but i mean you know even most people are not going to have an integrated subconscious with an ego and primary counter offer uh, unconscious they're not going to integrate these things probably even in, until their 30s maybe i mean well okay we can only sort of uh, that's a slight speculation because who knows if we actually had a, a culture that had real pedagogy and and proper developmental education and, and stuff like that um if these things were actually optimized for but uh, I, I also want to make some comments on that although they are they're adjacent to that but they're kind of in the same realm as that So women, I think, have a kind of very secure field circuit, whereas boys and men, in some sense, are made to feel bad that their subconscious stimulus emotional tone does not link up with their primary counteroffer emotional tone. And therefore, they're always trying to 
because the subconscious really is the seat of their independence, because that is also their sense of their, what it is that is actually under their control, under their command of their, their particular understanding, because the ego and the unconscious can simply inherit the environment, it can inherit the room, it can inherit what's going on already in some sense, it can kind of, it just has to glide and, and sort of surf on whatever the current, you know, sort of term oil might be, it, it can just sort of rise above that, whereas the subconscious really has to be able to construct it from the ground up, you know, independently. And so boys have to kind of, um, at least in this kind of gendered view of, of, of psychology, boys have to extend the reach of their subconscious and path it into their primary counter offer and then hope also to integrate this with the emergent response as well um, and probably uh, more natural for them to connect with the with the emergent response before the primary counter offer but that that connection won't even be stable unless it's anchored in the primary counter offer as well because the primary counter offer is going to um, rip the rug under from underneath the emergent responses feet anyway unless that because that is the the first relationship that the emergent response has i would say that, that the emergent response and the primary counter offer although i say that that's half true it is it, no when i say that it's half true i mean that it's not the it's not the primary counter offer, it's it's the thing behind the it's the hidden thing behind the primary counter offer, the super ego, which is not the same thing as the primary counter offer emotional tone. But that is kind of that is the uh, the original thing that even created the emergent response. The emergent response came out of the thing which then gets disguised or masked. Or, you know, where's the face of the primary counter offer? Um, and so, you know, the subconscious, at least in the masculine sort of perhaps line of development, reaching the primary counter offer is sort of late to the party, and then it has to kind of work out what's gone on here. And so boys, and or I'll just say the gendered, the, the, the male, the masculine line of development is, is already sort of confronted even at maybe an early stage with the mystery of psychology right in their development. Whereas women seem, or girls, the female line of development is much more at home with the fragmented or disjointed sort of thing. And it's interesting how these things, I think, can even be seen as metaphors for the different sort of, let's say, sexual strategies between the sexes. And also, I was also going to make a, a general point about how I think that, you know, the ages of growth within human development and how that corresponds to, you know, things like when puberty starts and when sexuality and when culture and when subculture develops within children's minds and in their lives and, and how they're processing it and how they're grappling with it and how the, uh, um, that these things... I think that sexuality is perhaps a, um, and this is perhaps not necessarily across the board, but this is, I think, a good enough kind of approximation or parallel, is that sexuality is code for the unconscious side of the mind. I think that, that when people are dealing in, in, in sexuality and issues of sexuality, um, that this is an intrinsically a um, uh, how do I uh, the identity of what you're doing in the world 
what your model of success is, what your aspiration is, what, what your goal is in the world, in, in the field of action, in, um, what will you do with your life? Getting to know your unconscious side of the mind and then developing that when you see like obviously people can have conceptually the framework of that quite young, but in terms of having it in a state that it's capable of being particularized and developed and matured, and uh, as, so perhaps also sort of um, self-directed uh, uh, in, in terms of the cultivation of one's own motivation in conjunction with that general concept of what are you going to do in the world um, So anyway, I think that that sexuality is something like the the Venn in the Venn diagram intersection between the stimulus and the primary counter offer. And once that has started to establish, then the emergent response can kind of anchor itself out of that and it's not to call it sexuality i think is not necessarily true but that i think is a is a version of a, it, it that's one of the main constituents in this category um of 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 what how you aspire to of your sense of what you do in the world. Uh, the imprint of what you do in your subconscious belief structure of your independent, you know, sort of um, so to have a persistent sort of self image of you know, so like, I mean, I've, I've described the subconscious as a, as a repository of what you be and the, un, and the unconscious is what you, as your sense of what you do. And once your, your sense of what you be wants to direct your sense of what you do, you have to emerge a sexual identity. I mean, that's not true, but it's not strictly speaking, technically true at all, but you need, I think that the, the most generic way that people perform that integration is by developing sexuality, if I can put it like that. Um, uh, okay, so... You know, the, the inverted commas, the gender role. How are you... What, what is your unique particular expression of masculinity or your particular unique expression of femininity? And, you know, and, and this essentially, I think that these major categories are, are indispensable categories because they are fundamentally not biological. They are fundamentally psychologically and spiritually necessary categories of um, coordinating uh complementary correspondences excuse the alliteration but uh, anyway I, I think that I think that that essentially works okay so so what also the uh, the, the Oedipal mother might essentially be doing and what borderline might essentially be doing is 
is essentially that they've they believe in a kind of merged psychology they don't believe in in separate iterations of of individuals having their own view of reality and their own anthropomorphization of an individual psychology they believe that there is only one model or at least they act as if there should only be one model that there is just their environmental model and everything is conflated into it and inserted into it and their particular field circuit where their primary counter offer and emergent response is established is kind of like their territory and if you want access to their territory you have to pay the price you have to pay protection money to to her archetypally i'm going to call it her and she has you know sort of guard posts and you know sort of shoot sh walls and uh, uh, you know sort of snipers on the fences and prisoners and hostage taking in this field circuit and you can't argue what she says is happening in the field circuit because she doesn't she, there's it's, it's just a complete um you know sort of authoritarianism of that field circuit and they essentially believe that they can get away with that kind of usurpation of that part of reality that they can just kind of sequester from everyone else. And I think that the the idea is, is just that they expect people to concede to that kind of compartment, because when they do this, they are compartmentalizing other people, because they're kind of using this field circuit to invent reality and then they're placing those reality labels onto other people as if they're handing out tasks like a taskmaster and then other people must just believe what they engineer and the thing is is that i also I believe that maybe their subconscious is kind of in on it, that it's not, um, their subconscious will help, will be like sort of Santa's little helper. A nice little lapdog. Um, whatever, but uh, that the subconscious is just a kind of, is just a, a diversion it's like it takes the heat off so if the field circuit is ever fails then they retreat to the subconscious and they collapse their field circuit and then but they turn it dark they don't they don't they don't ever do any house cleaning they don't ever go with you into the field circuit and actually order it into any kind of workable way they will say, oh, they'll, they'll talk through the valence of the subconscious and they'll say, oh, okay, well, I'm just too stupid then. You, you tell me the answer and you take full accountability and responsibility for it all. And okay, well, then you tell me how to do it instead and I'll just follow that like a robot. And then they'll do everything to kind of sabotage and go back to their, uh, to their manipulation and their unilateral hostage taking. And essentially, what perhaps uh, narcissists in their early life, what they've been injured by is that this field circuit has been regulated and decompartmentalized from their own environmental psychology. They haven't received the affection that they needed from all the emotional tones for them to explore and for them to have connectedness between their own circuitry and their own pathways and their own emotional tones so they've had a kind of no man's land and so they've never been able to um,
And so essentially the emergent response has had to kind of do the same thing as, as what they do in some sense, have the emergent response and primary counter offer working together, but then inventing a virtual pathway connected to the subconscious, but it's going in reverse. It's being, it's being primed or it's being devised or designed from the primary counter offer. The subconscious is just a kind of, um, shell and so this is kind of all coming from man i wonder if this is the exact opposite of how i've described narcissism before i don't think it is it might be the same i think it might be exactly the same i'm lucky if it is um, or at least it's some, you know, I always forget what I say about things. It's uh, terrible, you know, because I'm theorizing about new things and I'm always trying to, anyway. Um, I mean, I'd like to think that I talk so much that at least I probably have a high likelihood to try to be consistent just because I've drilled it into my own subconscious maybe. But uh, anyway, um, So, so what is their subconscious doing? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that essentially the problem is, is that their subconscious does not have a clear imprint of their emergent response. And so it seems to them that their ego is fragmented, but it's actually not that their ego is fragmented. It's that their subconscious is dysfunctional and dis disconnected. from independently doing their unconscious. And I think I was intuitively correct when I said in many recordings ago that narcissists need a kind of, they need, they need to relive their childhood. And what I say, what I mean by that is that they need, they need parental authority exerted over them and they need a kind of cocoon, but they also need a kind of, they need a kind of stringent or kind of moral, they need a moral template that is being, um, that is inculcating a safe, access to pathways and the affection of the emotional tones but that at the same time is coming hard down hard on them when they are kind of going beyond toying with morality or toying with being naughty you know when they're actually egregiously maiming the field circuits uh, or the the pathways that they are egregiously disfiguring or uh, they they need someone to call them out on their bad faith as it were if they're if they are using these things in bad faith but they need the relaxation that they can toy with them so that they can actually grow the pathway, that they can actually develop the pathway from the subconscious to the primary counter offer, which is not just a direct line. It's not just, you know, the shortest, the shortest cut gets you there, the, the shortest, you know, sort of travel route. You have to kind of know how to get there from, from every possible flow from every possible combinat you know it, it's it's a system it's a it's a you know it's a complete highway system you have to understand all the rules of the road otherwise you don't get your driver's license you know that's 
it's like that kind of so you need a driving instructor that's going to let you learn when you don't know how to drive and and let you go drive off the you know off the road where you know you can actually just get some some confidence and experience um even before you know all the rules that you're essentially exploring it so that that's all that kind of stuff okay so i think that's And that's the kind of the healthy narcissism of the young that where they're almost being slightly dishonest and, and confabulating things in using emotional terms. Let me think. Um, the biggest thing about being a child is essentially, I'm, I'm going to put it like this, is the indulgence in dishonor. Children get away with dishonor. No, that's actually not even correct. Um, I have to think about how to phrase this. I'm using a very archaic uh, definition of dishonor. Dishonor meaning um, that the letter in one speech is There are no rules. There, there, there are no rules of comportment, and the infliction of dishonor for a child is essentially not a crime. It's a necessary nebulousness or lapse. They indulge in a kind of ambivalence, which inflicts dishonor on those communicating with them. But that is the field in which that they are toying and exploring. Anyway, this is a very technical point. It's not that important, but I just wanted to make mention of it. Um, and it's part of basically the exploration that I was talking about in the drivers, in, in the driving and in teaching someone how to drive analogy with a driving coach or something. Anyway, um, going off road. And that, as I said, that dis, that kind of infliction of dishonor and that indulgence and ambivalence or, or, or the, that skating on nebulousness is essentially a kind of, is the cultivation of independence, is, is, the, is the, the groping tendril towards establishing an independence. And that is also the kind of naive narcissism, which I, I don't know the proper term for it, but, you know, the developmental narcissism, the healthy narcissism that is needed. And that can only, I think, be brought into a narcissist's life by recreating some kind of re rehashed, or sorry, replacement um, adolescence, which is, I don't know, you need a halfway house, you need like an adoptive parent, 
that is actually an authority figure that is actually capable of seeing, th you know, you need like a special psychologist that can see through the bullshit of the narcissist and invigilate it essentially. Uh, but, um, anyway, I, I think that that's, that's, uh, that's the only kind of program that I can see because without that backbone of normalcy, without that backbone of a kind of metamorality, I think that there is no access, there is no fluid access to development, because I think that you're not going to develop unless you have some kind of healthy handle. I mean, this is the, the riches and gems of culture and tradition had built within its mysteries, within its mythologies, within its cultural stores of you know um disney movies and you know sort of um aesop's fables and the, the briar rabbits you know um what was briar rabbit uh was it the Adventures of Bray Rabbit or something? But um, okay. Uh, and also, obviously, modeled, good models, as it were, like actual. When I say modeled, I mean like modeled psychology, and communication and interaction. Um, Perhaps you, the grafting of wisdom, you know, sort of, uh, and sound edifying, you know, sort of meta philosophy, you know, the, the Bill Cosby show, uh, real, you know, values and principles, real pedagogy bootstrapping, self-ownership, self-determinism, accountability, integrity. Okay. Um, What next? Uh, and I think I might have covered everything. Um, so I wanted to talk about gen gendered lines of development. I did that. I wanted to talk about... Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I think I split a, a topic near the start where I was talking about the feminine thing and then I was talking about the alchemical... the, the alchemical resonance... And obviously, that was those were also meant to be slightly connected. Um, that you know, so if if there is a well, I mean, my type, I have, in a sense, I have two emergent responses. Um, and that second emergent response has a has a threat potential threat of developing an uh, an independent primary a new primary counter offer which is uh, perhaps a kind of intruder or an alien or a kind of uh, uh, something around which other things can condense around and threaten the stability of um i because i i actually name each type after their primary counter offer that is how much i believed that the primary counter offer was the the primary axle around which the actual false ego complex constellated around or pivoted around and so having two primary counter offers is like having two personalities essentially um but that's only if the primary counter offers can't function in resonance because it's arguable 
that, by the way, my primary counter offer has a natural resonance. Well, everyone's will, because everyone has at least one resonance, although it's arguable that the red correspondences are, because they're inverse, there might be some insulation there. But essentially, everyone might at least have a possible alter ego that they could potentially switch into if... Anyway, again, that metatype symmetry thing doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's not, that's not a good enough... It's not only it's not that it's not good enough. It it seems like it's an unwieldy. It seems like it's not a good explanation anyway. Um, because as I'm talking, it makes sense to me that well, you know, if you have a particular primary counter offer, well, if it has an alchemical resonance with another emotional tone, that it, you might suddenly jump ship and and switch your primary counter offer. which would take you into another field circuit as well, if you did so. But so you could have a kind of alternative. So metagram types might, might be more fluid than metatypes. I mean, I've heard stories of people that have completely changed their personality. Uh, usually it's because of going through things in life. You know, joining the military and you know and it's not even the it's not like that they not not like trauma changed them but it wasn't even like going through some horrible thing overseas it was like the thing that changed them in the military was just the kind of the the drill the uh, the drilling and the discipline and the behavioral you know kind of m the behavioral modifications and such and and um, perhaps finding it easier to um, perhaps structures that weren't that well established in that not that they weren't developed but that they just weren't cemented found it easier to develop a completely ulterior valence you know because essentially that well your metatype is fixed but your metagram just kind of changed into an alter ego of itself bad analogy uh, or sort of bad use of words in, in this context what i'm already using these words a lot it's not good to mix up jargon with um, phrases but anyway uh, yeah so there's still so much yeah so this has always been my weakness is doing the secretary work just in order to make the next incremental progress. You know, it, uh, I sound like a bitter person, uh, but I mean, I guess th this th this will happen to you if you spend more than 20 years and this is your only, <laughs> you know, you kind of, uh, anyway, let me not be self-pitting. Um, this is what also makes all of this stuff so embarrassing. I still don't know what I'm talking about. And I've literally devoted my whole life to this. It's, um, but again, I mean, it looks like progress. So, <laughs> oh my word, it looks like progress. I mean, really, I don't have that much to really complain about other than potentially being uh, 
sent to the gulag by some black fascists, but uh, which which may be a still a remote possibility at this point. So uh, let me not be ungrateful. I guess I should stop this recording. I can't think of anything more intelligent to say. Um, I just say that the alchemical resonances themselves. I mean, maybe it's just that. You see, I don't want to make this claim because this is completely unfounded. This is just like sort of pure speculation and it's kind of like a, a theoretical deuce ex machina that if I, if I just claim that, well, the alchemical signatures are the same, ergo, they are also happening simultaneously. That when the one is happening, the other one is somehow captured in the same moment and charged up in the same moment because somehow the alchemical signature being the same has like a necessary corresponding um, vibration. that when energy is going through that emotional tone simultaneously it's it's there's a reading in this other emotional tone like a kind of radio re receiver because it it has the same uh you know sort of i don't actually know what it is about quartz crystals that make them able to, oh it's the vibration actually because they yeah so the, all the courses are actually vibrating and then there's a certain thing that's sort of going over them that's changing the, uh, I think they're being fed a, a, a certain amount of voltage that's changing the vibration and that's how you are tuning into different um, wavelengths or bandwidths or something like that. Um, So somehow it's like that these things are like crystals. These field circuits are like made out, out of crystals. I mean, it's interesting as well that, you know, obviously the, the breastplate of the Jewish priests all had 12 um, stones. I can't remember the name of the stone, but it's a stone that each of the stones, I mean, it's, it's, it's said to be one of the sort of the miraculous scientific correspondences that each of the stones has a certain optical property which was not scientifically quantifiable and even known in the time. But it just so happened that every gemstone that was used has this optical property. It's a kind of optical pro property that relates, I think, to creating... Um, I think, like, if you... If you get a translucent bit of the stone or you get light to refract from it, you can actually get light in every, I think you can get light in every spectrum or something like that, or in a wide spectrum of visible light. I think the property is, it has to do with that, that it kind of, um, they can all act a little bit like a prism, essentially, um, that they can uh, split all, all of these gemstones can can it's 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 something like that it's a it's an optical property that's like that. anyway it's not that important but um it might be an analogy to these 12 
I should probably clean up some things I was saying. I was very tired in the last recording. I mean, this is I, this is almost purely for my own ego, I guess, for me to say this. But I mean, I said Zachiel wrong. It's Ezekiel. Although, I mean, I... But, I mean, the reason why I just bring up Ezekiel and Samuel is because I believe that they are the most important uh, drivers of the Old Testament. Um, Ezekiel, in my, in my understanding of spiritual philosophy and the doctrine and the actual path that we took um, in our development, Ezekiel and Samuel are the most important. Ezekiel is the beginning of the story that leads to uh, well, I'll describe that later, and Samuel is the middle of the story. And the end of the story is Isaiah, but you, I think that you, 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 to properly understand Isaiah, you have to understand the base ingredients. You have to understand the beginning and the middle. You don't look at the end. You look at the beginning and the middle. And that's, that's my focus on Ezekiel and Samuel. And, you know, the importance of the last judge and the particular the people don't realize the the shift that was happening but this was uh yeah it, it, samuel is, is very very complicated and i and i don't want to uh you know it's, it's, it's going to sound like self-aggrandizement anyway but um it, it's a to me, it's, it's it's one of the most sophisticated aspects uh, in the Old Testament, and it's the 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 prayer that Samuel uh, is, is, is the answer to, essentially, is um, very early in, in the first book, where his mother can't remember it but it's um it's almost the prototype it, it that prayer is the true prototype of the messiah and the actual engineering of it is essentially the the life of samuel And it's, uh, uh, anyway, um, and you, you see how Samuel sets up the kings and how he counsels the people after ushering in this age. of kings and how it distorts the the spiritual line of progression and how let's say the spiritual line of pr progression has to kind of it gets subverted it has to kind of go underground in some way 
it gets convoluted in the drama of the politics surrounding the kings. But the, um, this new dynamic between godliness and politics and the subverted and underground spiritual philosophy in contradistinction to it is a more sophisticated problem and dilemma. And as Israel is spiritually processing this problem, it is, it is categorically the, the work of, it is the ingredients that are, are, are finally um, baked and, and, and fully rendered um by Isaiah but Isaiah didn't he he was uh he was just uh uh let's just say a, a product of what was um You know, he, he, he was, uh, anyway, so, um, okay, uh, anyway, so I, I, I think that it's, it's actually, it's better to understand the Son of Man by understanding the beginning, Ezekiel, and the middle, Samuel, than just going to the crib notes and reading Isaiah, because you don't know what you're, reading you don't you don't understand what it means what's gone into that because samuel might have been you know sort of the last judge but he he never stopped being the judge of israel The, the judgment just went underground and it never stopped. The, the time of the judges, the era of the judges, the epoch of the judges never ended. And, and this, is, this is one of the mysteries, I believe, in the New Testament. This is one of the... And to, to unlock it, you, you have to understand the beginning of that ark was Samuel Samuel did a lot of things that were proto messianic in that way in that wise he was he was playing a kind of politics That's, that's a very, I'm talking about his soul, I'm not talking about his, um, his decision making, I mean, you know. Uh, anyway, this is, this is very complicated, but I at least, I mean, I guess some people that listen to that might be able to get something from it, but anyway, let me not talk too much about it. But, um, you have to understand how complicated these things are. And, you know, they're complicated, and you can see just how complicated they are. You can just see the scope of the complication if you read Ezekiel, because then you, you realize that there are a lot of 
questions that need answering. There, there's a lot of wheels within wheels. Okay, so that's enough blabbering from me. Um, I guess I have to go back to hitting my head against the wall and trying to work out if all these things line up and do some secretarial work, I guess, as well. Oh, I should add this tiny note. Uh, you know, I've always... I've actually really hoped and believed that there would be some simple correlation between metatype positioning of cognitive functions and metagram emotional tones and their cognitive function constituents. I'd always thought that there'd be some be some pattern of some correlation, but I I mean I, I kind of that bias even expressed itself in my in my earlier speculation as to the alchemical um, symmetry uh, between certain pairs and other pairs and then I sort of just ended up going to a kind of you know the analogy of the quartz crystal resonance uh, which is just basically that the, the the metagram structure itself is is the bridge it doesn't bridge through metatype and so I just wanted to state plainly that although I had always hoped to find something in metatype to center things around, I still have not been successful in doing that. Although I still believe that there might be something, but it's going to be very simple and plain perhaps. And it's going to, and I mean, there might be other forms of subtype or subspecies of distinction that can be made by corresponding them because you could say oh well this person their primary counter offer or their emergent response or something like that is situated in terms of this overlay onto their metatype structure or their metatype architecture and so you know you'll see that oh well these emotion this emotional tone this primary counter offer emotional tone is you know coming from this sides of the mind this side of the mind's inferior function and that other side of the mind's child function and you know and, and there might be some strange peculiar you know kind of inference that can be drawn from that but it's not very neat it's not so, I mean, so, you know, I, I can already make those kinds of correlations with my own type. And when I look at it, it's like, oh, that's interesting. And you can kind of, you can kind of imagine some kinds of other dynamics around it, but they're going to be bespoke for the particular metagram and, and metatype uh, combination. You know, it's like in the same way that people combine Enneagram and, and MBTI, you know, it's like it's a different language, but you can combine them and you get some more descriptive layers of, of analysis or something like that. But it's not it's, it's not really satisfying or it's not helpful. And it's certainly well, I mean, the real thing is, is that if there are any solid correlations. Um, oh, that's something that I haven't thought about, actually, is the uh, final five, eight configurations of final five signature taking those that could be uh, there could be a consistent pattern from metatype using that which would also make more sense because that's the aspect of the 17 model which is more distinctly you know is, is that so those final five dimensions are going to be scattered around some in this side of the mind some in some other side of the mind there might be an interesting correlation between those where they fall within certain ambits of each of, of particular sides of the mind for a particular metatype and then the and then the Because I mean, I've I've not been able to reverse engineer yet 
how I was able to somehow derive that these metagram circuits are these meta type, or actually, uh, this is embarrassing. I think I've admitted this before. I don't actually have a perfect. I don't have a perfect layout. Uh, in some sense, this means that I didn't completely finish metagram, but I finished it close enough. Uh, let me explain. Is that I, I took all the metagram circuits. And I was able to divide them into 17 groupings. So I don't know for sure that each particular grouping does pertain to each particular metatype. I empirically corresponded many of those groups, which, which I think are roughly correct. I, uh, maybe they, some of them have errors. But there are 17 distinct groupings and I haven't been, that's what I haven't been able to reverse engineer is how did I derive those 17 distinct groupings. But th that was very solid. That was a kind of solid derivation. So there is something special about those, the designation into 17 groups. And then I empirically associated those groups with Maybe I was a bit lazy when I was doing this when I was developing Metagram, but I said to myself, it's important that I reverse engineer this and because this is essentially the major falsification test is this whole topic. And so I didn't, I, 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 I believed that I could have actually in a more direct way worked out which belong to which, but I didn't want to do that yet because I didn't have enough data about meta type that I didn't believe that I had all of the puzzle pieces yet. So I, so I lapsed that into the future, you know, I, I just, um, put pause on that, but essentially, you know, so this is the baggage that I've sort of been carrying all this time. Uh, that is left to be integrated and now you know the crunch time of when all these things have to come together you know I don't like talking about this because it is embarrassing as hell but um, th that's the honest state of the theory um, but again it's uh, you know, maybe I'm playing a long con game on myself and it's just a giant Ponzi scheme and it never kind of, it never settles out. But uh, I am making progress and I think hopefully it'll, it'll be settled one way or the other. Uh, but uh, I mean, I have hope that this was all not in vain and for naught. And that I wasn't just wasting my own time. And I don't think that I've infused any kind of desperate desperation or hope into my... I mean, this has been a, just a, uh, a very arduous intellectual exercise and pursuit. Um... You know, there's a kind of, there's a cynical discipline, which is, you know, ne a necessity when doing this kind of work over the span of time that I have done it over. I guess I'll just say that to myself in, in the most stoic and hopefully least self-pitying sentimental way that I can muster, although it's, it's not hard. Uh, but anyway, this is the... Uh, uh, always found it disgusting this this kind of this uh, this this kind of strange strange paradox of um, you know, of, of, a, of a very serious profession, uh, 
that I have been solely devoted to, you know, sort of in my basement my whole life. Um, kind of in the dark. Uh, but anyway, it's... It, I mean, I, I guess I am hopeful for it, but I mean, to tell you the truth, I am rather dispassionate about it either way. I mean, if I could, I mean, obviously I can't put it down until it's, until it's gone, until it's finished. But, um, you know, if it, if it really is a failure, uh, you know, it, it, it actually wouldn't faze me. Um, it would actually be quite a relief just to be able to graduate onto, uh, some kind of life, you know, with a, with a very strange, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to, to have a full-time job as, as a, as, well, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's hard. I, I mean, I generally say that I started this work when I was seven years old and now I'm turning 35 uh, quite soon. So I've, uh, so for four fifths of my life, for 80% of my life, I have been doing this work. And nothing else. Well, I mean, I mean, I've been doing other things on the side, essentially, but, um, you know, in some sense, always as a kind of adjacent sort of uh, uh, necessary consort to this quest. I guess the consolation is, is that if it, if I do actually see it work out, I think I would be able to write a book about it very, very quickly. I think I would be able to write a book in even a week. It, uh, I would have a draft or I'd have a draft for the vast majority of it. I think it would, it would order my thinking or, I mean, having the technical thing done, it would give me, uh, it would give me the latitude to to finally have a kind of more crystallized oversight because I mean although I I do I'm very good at aggregating sort of metaphysical and philosophical points you know I I am always hedging these things in a kind of speculative um, variance of of possibility and um, obviously there's always a spectrum of, uh, you know, sort of how you can express something, but, um, that kind of variation is not, uh, it's not anywhere close to the kind of, um, sort of mental allowances, uh, that one has to make and sort of concessions, uh, uh um, that one has to hold one's tongue in, uh, in a kind of innate, um, suspension of, uh, of making concrete, uh, claims about the structure and all the, all of these structures and aspects of the structure are are interdependent and interwoven and, and interrelated. And so, you know, it, one has to uh, uh, be quite abstract uh, and sort of, sort of esoteric and, and hedged in everything that one says. Whereas with this done, it will allow me to really finish off and crystallize all the other subcompartments of, of, the, of the field. 
um, will allow me to, to, to philosophically outline um, the, the, you know, and, and to fully describe the domain of each of the, you know, of, of the, of the various models that make up um, the system. I mean, I was actually thinking recently that uh, Metagram itself could even have a subtitle of the science of morality. Obviously, within the context of psychology, but um, and I was thinking if that is perhaps even a, a good general title for a book, the science of morality, and then you know you open it and it's like, well, it's all about psychology, but it's about psychology that has a philosophical implication or gist or you know sort of um, import. Uh, But I mean, there are also sort of various, a various slew of books w which which suddenly become much more kind of feasible. But um, I said, just talking about you know making voice recordings is also. I mean, I, I see no need to, to be published, um, but so, some of these technical things are will, will be much better captured um, in words, but uh, explanatory YouTube videos and sort of uh, discussion around it and perhaps the development of a, of a typology, you know, kind of... Um, I don't even know what they call them. Um, body of of you know a following of acolytes of, of people that are interested in the field, of of interested um, people that want that want to educate themselves in psychology, and essentially you know essentially be a kind of coup in the realm of psychology. Um, Again, I, I feel no uh, particular need to, to, to be published. Um, uh, I mean, it's the, essentially the only thing that, that would help me is uh, uh, to finish my work is just to make the work available and uh, then perhaps to work out what I w want to do with it further in my personal capacity or um, in terms of, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it's, I'm even thinking at the moment of sort of getting, trying to get into politics or some kind of movement or organization. I mean, I think a kind of cultural movement might be very useful. Um, a, a cultural movement that's not about activism, but that's about real action. It's about sort of forging a an actual, that's really about, if, being effective on the ground and and pushing for changes and applying pressure the right kind of pressure in terms of um imposing campaigns um that the movement you know is a part of against particular decisions against the criteria of particular decisions against particular policies to have particular policies changed in a very strategic minded way in order to create a, a different kind of way of battling um, the culture war. Uh, anyway, th those are, I guess, the ideas that are kind of going in my head. But, um, but also, it, it makes a lot more sense when that kind of movement has a moral foundation, has, um, has let's say, a really robust idea about what education should look like, a really robust idea about what, um, you know, the state at which certain things should be at. Um, something to aim towards, but then also a kind of strategic push towards those things, a very um, particular uh, uh, strategy 
of you know combating the cl- the decline of democratic illiteracy combating the 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 decline of of basic liberal democratic values and um campaigning against institutionalized corruption in the legal system and in uh, um particular institutions and getting those particular institutions cleaned up or, or developing substitute institutions um so that we can actually have a a clean place that is morally untainted or is at least is morally resilient and has a filtering mechanism to protect the people that want to enjoy that territory from being assaulted by this kind of you know by the kind of the the hostage taking the 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 moral decompartmentalization and the kind of the the rabid fascistic and also the bumbling fascists because there are a lot there are more bumbling fascists you know the people that i call proto-fascists these bumbling fascists that just don't they don't care about values they don't care about morality they don't care about basic rights they just care about the superficial virtue signal they just go with the crowd they go with the mob mentality and they you know they stick their head into the sand as it were but i do think that it's more a kind of bad faith because they like constructing the illusion they like being a part of policing and enforcing the um the the moral code of the vacuous etiquette that has displaced real morality um And again, I think all these things require, they require on a cultural level, taking them to some kind of precipice where you're actually defending a fence and you're saying, we don't, you're not allowed, this is private property and we don't let, we, we, you're not invited. This is a private university and you can't demand that you become a student if you don't have our basic requirements of integrity and values if you're not a non-racialist uh if if you want to indulge in your disgusting morality you know this is not a place for you to be fostered or cultivated or refined in any way we want nothing to do with you we find you uh you know you know a, a different kind of allegiance with the south african constitution even as it's been betrayed by its own constitutional court in the institutionalized corruption of the law itself and the the betrayal of the constitution that that we suffer from um, in general, the betrayal of the section one value of non-racialism. So anyway, um, I think that uh, uh, this culture war is only going to ever make real progress when we start to extricate ourselves extricate our institutions or have substitute institutions and structures that we safeguard and that we simply say to these other people that they are not invited uh, and and that they are not they are not welcome because they are morally uh re- reprehensible And until we can hold that line on a cultural level, we can't, sadly, we can't create the kind of moral example needed in order to put things like the constitutional court judges to shame in their destruction of South African constitutional values because they've only kept the window dressing. They've only kept the lipstick. anyway and we're going to be hard our democracy is going to be hard boiled everything is going to disintegrate if we don't um if we don't start holding a line and then seeing if we can convince people to join us on our side of the fence and to put some pressure on on those well not pressure 
indirectly put pressure on them by just saying, no, we repudiate you. This is, we're not going to let you slowly erode and, and corrosively gnaw at us and bully us and expand your web. We're actually going to hold against you. And I think at least if we don't even try that, I think we haven't put up a strong enough defense of the South African constitution. We haven't put up a, 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 a strong enough um, So I, th I think that if we don't do that, uh, it's really the least we could have done. Um, to defend the hard-won democracy. And, and if we don't do that, I think it will be proof that we did not deserve the new South Africa. And even though it was stolen from us and we were betrayed and it was murdered by those who held leadership positions and authority uh, in, in the state, I think that um, I think that it will be evidence that it is the people themselves that um, that got the government that they deserved. Uh, and so I, I do think it's up to us. It 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 we have. Uh, the direct culpability and we have only ourselves to blame if we don't succeed I, 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 I really uh, do see it this strictly and I think making such a cultural movement makes my point more evident makes this thesis more evident and I want it to be evident I want people to choose a side, um, consciously, as it were. Um, or, I mean, it's not that they have to choose one side or the other side, but at least if they don't choose my side, I want to say, I, I do want to say that, that, well, you know, in terms of what happens in the future, um, it was the people that failed. It, it wasn't, uh, it, it, it was the moral fiber of the people themselves that did not deserve democracy. They would not uh, stand for it. Uh, instead, they allowed the culture to be hard boiled. They allowed the politics to devolve into fascism and the, the fascistic worldview essentially which is what we're currently drowning in and uh, and the courts have made it plain that essentially they're not interested in in saving the South African citizen of saving the individual holder of rights they only care about the racial category holder of rights somehow moral consideration is vested in in the race in the group not in the individual. It's utterly contemptible. There's no excuse for it. Um, but for people that are insensitive to this, uh, I must say, I, I mean, it, it, it does, sadly, it does repeat my general point is that did we deserve uh, what we got if we hardly made any move to keep it just how quickly the toxic narrative uh, crept and twisted to keep up with the oligarchy 
you know, sort of enrichment scheme. Anyway, this is a very somber way of putting it, but uh, these are my plans. Um, perhaps quite cynical, but uh, I mean, these, these, are, these are absolutely important values to have vindicated and affirmed. And if people themselves cannot be bothered to vindicate or be part of affirming them, then then I think we do deserve what uh, what is being incubated the demon the monster uh, the same one that was incubated in Weimar, Germany. It reminds one of that poem. I can't remember in the poem, did the, did the monster actually... I don't know if the poem actually describes the monster actually being born or if it's all hypothetical. Isn't the whole point of the poem that the monster is waiting to be born? As it slouches, you know, it's, it's hypothetically described as slouching towards Bethlehem. I, man, I can't remember the whole poem. I can't even remember the name of the poem. People would generally probably know the poem that I'm referring to. I can't even remember the author of the poem. Was it? Man, I'll just embarrass myself if I am. I'm purely guessing. I'm going to guess it was Kipling. But I, I can't remember at all. Is it called Antichrist? I can't remember. I think that that is what that is the definition of failure. I do think this is somewhat a trial by fire. This is the cultural trial by fire. And can we emerge from our cultural nomadism into being deserving? of the South African Constitution and the New South Africa. That, I believe, is, is essentially a question of our time. Anyway. <laughs>